Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. <coughs> Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate, and we are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. What's going on, guys? This is Dave Tate, and we are now at episode 124. 124? I almost said five. Getting ahead of myself here a little bit. Uh, before we get started here, I want to thank our sponsors for the show. First sponsor is Merrick Health. Merrick Health is a premium telehealth platform focusing on hormone optimization and preventative medicine. They have two different tracks, which I've talked about with you guys before. The first one is a self-service lab track, where if you go to Merrick Health backslash Table Talk, you'll see the panels that we have set up. The panels that are set up now are essentially the ones that I've been using for the past 15 years, which focus on the hormone. There's a hormone panel, lipid panel, CBL panel with differential, DHEA, comprehensive meta, uh, metabolic panel, lipid panel, cortisol, basically everything that you need to be keeping track of. If you use, if you go the self-guided route, there's a couple options here that you'll see if you go to americhealth.com backslash table talk and see what it is. One, the one path is how I basically have done it, how most people do it. You just order the labs, you get the labs, and you review the labs yourself. If you know somebody that knows the labs, they review the labs itself. That's essentially how it goes. And if you wanna take it to your doctor, that's up to you. Most of the time, the doctors don't have a clue what you're talking about, so that is what it is. So they still have that to where you can just get the labs. For an extra 50 bucks, you can get the labs with a result review. I don't, want, I don't want to say that it's meeting. It's not the custom monopolization. It's, it's a lab report, okay. which is what it is. So with my labs, originally, it's just a couple pages like you would normally get through any labs that you're going to have done. The lab report, report for me was 42 different pages. So it's going through all the different indicators, all the different panels, telling you where the range is, why it's op what's optimal, where you're at, some suggestions for that. That is that's the self-guided route. So you can either go with the report or not with the report. If you go through the table talk, whatever it is, you know there is a discount code of 10% on that. That's what I was kind of directing people through before I really knew what the custom optimization was or the custom optimization or guided optimization is they set you up with a premium patient care coordinator, which now that I've gone through all that, I can speak a little bit more about how this process works. So you, you get hooked up with your patient care coordinator, you speak to them, and then they help you decide what labs need to be run. Then you run those labs, then when the labs come back, you still have the lab report, you still have all that there. And then what they'll do is they'll put you in touch with a care provider that can either write prescriptions for where you need the optimization or suggest supplements to be able to help with that optimization. That is a hell of a service because most people don't have access to a Dr. Eric Serrano like I have. Mm. So as you've heard through some of the podcasts in the past, people complain and even online people complain because they can't find a doctor that knows what the hell to do for preventative medicine. They can't find a doctor that knows what to do for hormone optimization. Even if it's just mitigation, I'm not gonna tell you that America Health is gonna write you scripts for tons of shit, that's not gonna happen, but they have the doctors in place or hormone specialists in place to help minimize you know, mm. the damage of people that are gonna wanna blast when they probably shouldn't be blasting in the first place. The only mm. reason they're blasting is because it's not optimized in the first place. So if you go with the custom optimization, you'll set, it, you'll set that up and then when you go to check out or you go to pay for that service, you'll give them the discount code Table Talk. you'll get 10% off that as well. That's MerrickHealth.com. And the links are in the description for all these services that I just talked about. The other sponsor, of course, is EliteFTS.com. We have everything that goes. <laughs> yeah, and they look so, oh, my God, I can't believe that. How'd you get that sponsor? I had to work this one for years, man. Big fish. To be able to get this one, yeah. you know, locked in. But 
If you can put it in a gym bag or load plates on it, we have it. We actually just loaded a new gym bag to the site yesterday. So mm -hmm. now we actually have the gym bag as well. So whatever your training needs are, it's leadfts.com. If you use the discount code TABLETALK, you will get 10% off your first order. We also have the limited edition apparel, which helped to directly support the podcast. Last week, we launched the GFH limited edition T and half of those are already sold out. So you guys want to get to elitefts.com and pick up the limited edition shirt before it's gone. The GFH, GFH shirt does stand for get fucking huge. So I don't have to sit here and say get freaking huge. You know, or any of this other <laughs> crap that I had to do with the first iteration of that. So the discount code, guys, is Table Talk, and that's 10% off your first order. So that's the sponsors that we have today. Now let's get to the actual podcast. Today I have Swede Burns back. We got a few things that we want to talk about, and we have his guest, Sin, which we'll just say Sin, right? <laughs> that works. <laughs> that way we can keep all the rest of it anonymous so she doesn't get the hate, yeah. you know, DMs and all the other kind of shit that just comes around with being part yeah. of all this. It's attached to this. Yeah, yeah. but I want, to, yeah. I want to congratulate you on being a father. Thank you. Know? you. So Thank it's, you. It's, that's yeah it's, it's changing life changing right life we were talking about experience. it a little bit beforehand yeah we, we touched yes. on it briefly yeah it's been uh it's been the most surreal experience in my life uh as well as the most profound i got to hold her when she came out like i was part of the birth we used a midwife mm -hmm. so i was able to like actually see her little head coming out and her body's mm -hmm. still in there and when she first opened her eyes looking at me when she coughed her first breath of cough blood on my face you know mm -hmm all that stuff and, and laying her on there you kind of you see that first breath and it's man there's something to that i just i've never seen any I've never experienced anything like that in my life to see like a little human sort of come to life for yeah. the first time and you how know? old is she now uh well she was only 11 so we're at about two weeks two weeks yeah, yeah she's so. a little late it was uh you know our first our first baby so the first ones usually run a little late mm -hmm. uh so she was uh, a few days late she was supposed to be on the eighth so mm -hmm. Now I'm like, the eighth came and went, and I'm like, all right, so we're just going to treat these like normal days and do work. <laughs> and yeah, I'm like, no, yeah. I'm not going to sit around and wait to go to the hospital, you know? And uh, so we kept going to work. We kept, uh, which for us is like we drive over to Starbucks, and I sit and write and handle my clients and so forth. And uh, my wife is actually part of the operation. She's the editor. She actually edited this book. Mm -hmm. And she helps me out with a good deal of the online stuff in terms of getting stuff up on the site and so forth. You know, it's too much for me to handle. I'm pulled in 20 different directions. I got like, at any time I have 10 irons in the fire, so I gotta oh, yeah, manage I all the, you know how it is. Well, I know how it is. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy that the, um, the, the benefit, it's, I, what I was saying, benefit, the, when, after I had my first, you know, the, the big realization for me was I was working as a trainer at the time. Mm. You know, so I was out of the house from like six in the morning until nine at night. Mm. Like, I need to change, you know, my life. You know, I need to change how things are going. So change I have the routine. quantity time. Yeah. You know, right. Yeah. So it's, people talk about quality time and quantity time. And a lot of that is kind of dependent upon, you know, what they do for a living and all the other kind of stuff. But yeah. I always wanted to, because I kind of fuck things up a lot, mm. you know, just with every, I, 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 right. I, I fall, I fail forward more than most people. It takes a few tries. Yeah. 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 You know, so most things, I always yeah. wanted to. <laughs> make sure I had the quantity time. Yeah. You know, so my ability no. to be able to work where I could, you know, so you're, you're, you're blessed in that regard because yeah, I am so blessed because of the fact that I'm, you know, honestly, not just that, but that, that certainly that too, but that's not the only reason it's, it's at this point in my life, I'm ready. I wasn't ready to be mm -hmm. a father. You know what I mean? Prior to this, I wasn't, uh, I just wasn't prepared. And I, you know, I feel like God knows that he gave me, mm -hmm. he gave it to me cause I was ready. Mm -hmm. And it was something I've always wanted. I've always wanted to be able to have a family. And, you know, so I waited until I was married, tried, you know, and uh, succeeded mm -hmm. with no issues the first time we really tried. And, uh, yeah, I think if it happened any other point in my life, I wasn't ready. You know? yeah. So it's like it's one of those things where, like, it, it's fortunate for a number of reasons. It's good that, like, I'm ready as a man to, to teach a child about the ways of the world and how to, you know, just to bring her up correctly, mm -hmm. you know, train her up the right way. But uh, it's also, like you said, the quantity of time, having that, the quantity of time available, you know, where I am able to work from home with a lot of the stuff I do. Mm -hmm. You know, a good, a good percentage of the coaching I do now is distance stuff, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm able to be around, which is awesome. Uh, she's about two weeks old. I've been away. This is the longest I've been away from her mm -hmm. by far mm -hmm. <laughs> since she was born. <laughs> like I, uh, yeah, I mean, driving out here, I was like, 
it was hard to leave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I'm like, oh, what am I? What if I have to turn around halfway? I might not make sure everything's covered. You know, I'm like double checking stuff. And I'm somebody who I usually act with confidence because mm -hmm. I have a plan for things. You know, I'm a planner. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I can just move forward. I know that this is the right move, and then whatever the next thing is, I can make the right move based off of that. But this is something with which I have very little, no experience, essentially mm -hmm. being a father. So although I have these things that in theory sound good, you know, we know how theories play out. Oh, yeah. If you've been in the strength training game for any period of time, you've heard probably some harebrained theories, mm -hmm. and you see the way they play out, you know. And so uh, it's, it's important to be able to test this stuff out. So I'm kind of I'm learning as I go. My wife, we both are. You mm -hmm. know, we're learning as we go, but we're... Uh, we're just really grateful. It's, um, it's such a blessing. The whole thing is such a blessing. The timing as well, because uh, I was finishing up the book for mm -hmm. the CERT course while she was pregnant, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm like, when are we going to be able to fit the CERT course in between with the baby? You yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying to schedule all this stuff. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. man, I'm trying to get this stuff laid out correctly because I'm a very, I'm very, uh, I'm very conscientious, like in terms of I like to have everything orderly. I like to have a list of what's going to happen when and then. I don't really got to think it through. I know, okay, I'm doing that. I've already yeah. thought this through. Next thing, I've already thought this through. This was something where I had to do a lot of thinking on the fly. and uh, Yeah, a lot so, of that's not going to change. Dude. Nah, man. Nah. It's, 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 it fell into place, It's a little right? human. It fell into place, though, didn't it? It's <laughs> yeah. a little human. Yeah, they're unpredictable. <laughs> <laughs> unpredictable. So it's an unpredictable little yeah, human. Yeah, um, It but fell into place. Yeah. I mean, I think, look, I just like, you know, I'm somebody, you know, I'm a, I'm a man of faith. Like, I trust God. And uh, I do my best. I get up. I work as hard as I can every day at whatever the task is. And I just, you know, I trust that God will work the rest of it out for me. Yeah, it was. It's I. You mentioned we're going back and forth on the cert course, and we'll kind of, we'll get to that here in a minute. And um, but he's he's going to you're going to be doing a certification course for the fifth set. It's going to be here. So we're trying to figure this date out and all this other stuff. <laughs> and it's I'm like, well, it's there's there's only so many things I really have going on. You right. know, but then Swiss came and these other things are coming. I'm like, dude, look, we got to kind of figure Perfect. this out, you know, because <laughs> yeah, like, now all of a sudden I got all this other shit kind of loading on here. And then the podcast guests and all the other kind of stuff. But it was the summer out. of summers for you. You got the, the Swiss thing happening. Yeah, yeah. You got the podcast is really. Yeah, the Swiss the podcast. Really There's possible. stuff going on all the time. And I'm like, wow, we got to get this in here. And I'm like, we, it's, we'll figure it out. You know, it wasn't that it wasn't a matter of that. It's like, we'll figure it out. We'll get it in there. But before we get into that, I think mm. we need to step back a little bit because the. The listeners change, you know, frequently. Oh, sure, it's just yeah. the nature of the internet. It's the nature yeah, of YouTube yeah. and stuff like that. And, and powerlifting. For that and, and powerlifting, yeah. <laughs> I mean, when you're years. around for a long time, you see, you know, every few years, it's a, it's a whole different. There's a, there's a steady group that lasts forever, right? right. And then there's, there's a lot of turnover with that. So just briefly kind of recap what the fifth set is, what the origins were. Sure. R, I guess. Sure. Were, are, so, origins. Hmm. so that's like how far back do I take this? Well, first I'll I would I'll take it all the way back. I'll take it all the way back. Know. Yeah. But first I'll tell you what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Because what what it is is not usually what it starts as, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you what it is. What it is is a it's a complete methodology for the sport of powerlifting, for training and competition in the sport of powerlifting. So it's basically soup to nuts. It's everything you need to know from the first time you pick up a bar to all the way up until you plan for a meet, peak for a meet everything in terms of attempt selection, even at the meet, and then everything you need to know in terms of what comes after a meet, how long do I wait, do I, how do I reboot, all of that stuff is covered. So basically what I wanted to do was simplify, because for me, like my goal, and I, I think this is similar to your goal, I wanna get people involved in powerlifting, which is the thing that I love, that, that saved my life, that changed my life for the better. I wanna get as many people to try it mm -hmm. as I can. I know if they'll try it, the, well, the more people that try it, the higher number are going to get from it, what I did, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so the idea was to get as many people as possible to try it. So although I, I had developed it, and I'll get into the, the development stages a little bit later, I, you know, I wasn't on the team yet here, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't really have as much reach. I was doing basically a powerlifting meet at least, I would say at least two a month coaching, traveling mm -hmm. around with different people, and so I was all over the place. And anybody that was involved in powerlifting would know who I was. But that didn't help me with what I wanted to do with reach people to bring them into powerlifting. So I knew that a lot of people that weren't doing meets would be involved, would be following Elite FTS. I mean, I certainly did before I ever did meets, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, that's, maybe that's not true, but I think the first person was my, my high school mm -hmm. coach. Uh, what is his name? Oh, man. Jim. 
I'll remember it and I'll say it throughout this podcast yeah. because he's the reason that I that I really started competing. He got me to do my first one. But essentially right after that, I guess Elite FTS came out right after that, around 1998. When I mm-hmm. first started mm-hmm. looking into information, that was when I graduated high school. That was when I was really starting to get decide, am I going to keep pursuing powerlifting or am I going to go? And I ended up going into bodybuilding for a while. But while I was in that initial stages there of, of uh, figuring out what I wanted to do with the lifting, because the lifting had been a part of my life for as long as I've been alive, essentially, I started going on EliteFTS.com and reading articles and seeing things that you guys were putting up. And I can remember it was one of the first places where you could buy things that were specific for powerlifting, mm-hmm. you know? And... Uh, Jeez. So that was, you know, I, I read information. I can remember years ago. Uh, I guess it has to be, it has to be twenty years ago. When did you do that first? Those first set of bench videos. Probably about twenty years. About ago. twenty yeah, years. Yeah, so yeah, it was yeah. right around yeah. like the beginning, right yeah, around yeah. that time. I can remember seeing those, and I can remember thinking, "Oh, this is this is good," you know. And I learned a lot from that mm-hmm. stuff. And then I went on and did it for so many years and coaching and everything else, but without getting too far off, off the point here, I wanted to make it easy for people to access the sport of powerlifting. Like, I can remember when I was a kid and did my first meet and I was there and I was really uncomfortable and I can remember like some of the more negative aspects that were involved, like going in the bathroom and there was like somebody in there doing drugs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. I went out and like told my coach, I'm like, oh, there's somebody. He's like, yeah, don't, don't talk to those people. I'm mm-hmm. like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's but it's like uh, you know, at that time period, it was a little, it was different. It was little, no, it was little, different. Yeah. It was scary. Yeah, you it was were like yeah. young. You were. It was, it was something that was hard to get into, and there weren't like there was not the female com- number of female competitors around yeah. either. It was intimidating, I guess you could say. If you're, I started when I was fourteen. Yeah, I was you know, like so, sixteen. Yeah, so yeah. Barrier for entry. Mm-hmm. If you didn't have somebody that was pulling you in, you weren't going to just, mm-hmm. you know, for a, for a profile pic, photo op, go do a meet or something like yeah. people do now. You know, it wasn't something. It wasn't mm-hmm. really an option. You'd have been so uncomfortable where you never finished the meet. And also, there was another barrier for entry. You had to know how to use gear, and I had no mm-hmm. idea. And there wasn't really anyone that was good to teach me. My school had a, a few bench shirts. It might have only been two. Mm-hmm. Neither one of them did I understand how it could help me in any way. So I, I ended up benching without it. Mm-hmm. And I remember my coach telling me, he's like, that, that's, what, uh, that's what people call raw. He's like, that's what hard asses do. And I was like, mm-hmm. like yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Raw. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, I mean, and then I then I ended up transitioning into bodybuilding. But long story short, the idea when I wrote that first book, the idea for me was I wanted to make. I already had a system that I use with the people that I coached. Right, I'm a systems guy. Everything I do is a system. There's a formula for everything. And uh, I wanted to. How can I simplify this? How could I distill this down to its simplest form? Because I know powerlifters. If you have Facebook, it's obvious. Power lifters do not have the best reading comprehension. You can be scrolling down a post on Facebook and read the comments, and the guy's arguing with the other guy about what he said, but that's not even what he said. And the first guy's arguing back, and like he doesn't even understand what the second guy said. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to have to make this really simple. I realized mm-hmm. early on this is going to have to be a simplified version. So the first fifth set book that we did was a, a very simple version. It was something that I wanted anybody could pick that book up that had never done a meet. And you could still do that. That first book, in that ebook that we, mm-hmm, you, know, mm-hmm. you could pick that up and you could know nothing about powerlifting. And from that book, you could glean everything that you need to know to actually do a meet and not make a complete fool of yourself. I mean, it's the basics, it's the stuff people get wrong. Here's how you set up your training, mm-hmm. right? You do enough training. Here's how you peak. Based on how you did on that peaking cycle, here's how you select attempts. You know what I mean? Here's mm-hmm. where your, your, your attempt selection is going to be. If you stick to that, you're going to do pretty good. Like, regardless of how much mm-hmm. experience, you're going to do all right. Like, it's, it's kind of, and so the idea was to give people a good experience. It turned out that it worked even a lot better than that, that simple version. I mean, Ellen is still doing that. I was running it for probably, like, what, the first couple of years. At least. After, yeah, even yeah. after after everything else came out. You know? Yeah, yeah. And that first book was really such a, a foundation and fundamental life changer really i guess when you and i had met i i'd reached out and i was like I i'm really struggling um i was doing all my own programming but it was way too complicated for me to even keep track of so fancy water <laughs> so like successful in some ways right and then yeah. having this standardized system where you know what you're doing 
you know when you're going to do it, and all you have to do is right. focus on actually executing. If this, then this. If yeah. this, then yeah. this. It makes it so much easier. Yeah. If you're alone and you don't have someone whose brain you can pick all the time that's got a little experience, it it's helps you great. Focus. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's an order of operations. You know what I mean? It's like a math problem. It's like, yeah. Do this, then do this. So, with you, right? Like we met. The first time we met was at Rum, right? Yeah. 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 So you were already an elite competitor. At that point, you to rum to get into rum, you had to qualify. Qualifying total for rum at that time was considered that's for raw what it was to be elite, right? Yeah. Well, let's let the let the listeners know what our lifts are, our total, how long right. you been competing, and so at that point, that's that's kind of what I'm getting. Yeah. At. Okay. At that point, what was your what was your total? I don't even. It was like seven something. Right? It was like seven thirty-five, maybe. Something okay. Like that. Okay. And and now it's. Thousand something. Mm, like right? a thousand five was the last meet we did. The most important thing between those two numbers, I understand, is that when she decided she was going to run FISA, she had already decided to retire from powerlifting. Mm -hmm. She was like, I can't make any more progress. I keep getting injured. I don't think that, I think I'm at the point where this is where my genetics will take me. Yeah, I was and, done. And I can remember saying, Will you just try this? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And she's like, Okay, yeah, I'll try it. And she's somebody who, like, you know, she takes it seriously. If she's going to try, she's going to give it the college try. And uh, yeah, it went really well. Yeah. Right? I mean, your first meet, you PR'd huge. Yep. And you PR pretty much, is it every meet? It's, it was pretty <laughs> much every, yeah. It's actually yeah. been pretty, pretty much every meet, I think. Pretty much every meet she's PR'd to get from there to, to, to where we are now. And, I mean, I think that's what a career should look like in powerlifting is a long time of making progress in the beginning you're going to get that what you can mm -hmm. get you know you can get whatever you can get based on your genetics and there are some people that are so gifted genetically that they can do the stupidest shit you can imagine and still improve faster than everybody else mm -hmm. just because of where they are on that on that normal distribution for talent like on that bell curve you know this far right people are so gifted they're so so high in recoverability and adaptability they can literally just do nothing but max on everything and they're gonna get way stronger than everybody else, you know? But those are not the people to look to for what to do. Mm -hmm. There might be psychological things you can glean from them, like, yeah. you know, in terms of how to, uh, you know, how to attack a lift or how to approach something from a mental standpoint. But yeah, from a coaching standpoint, that's not, that's not a good source of information. Like, how did you get there? I'll give you an example. I did, uh, I had a guy who was, uh, he did semi-pro hockey and he was really good, Eddie. You remember Eddie? Yeah. So he was on the Keyhole Barbell Powerlifting team also. So he was doing, a, he was running fist set. They just had him running fist set. Just running it straight up out of the box the way it's written. And uh, he was trying out for, I don't know if it was Youngstown Phantoms or one of the other ones that we took him to, but it was a, this was a hockey camp. I've never seen them take 40s at a hockey camp. It was a selection camp for hockey. And uh, he ran a 4-3-40, laser. Like, that's better than 99% of the history of NFL. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just, like, unbelievable. Not necessarily, I don't think, the most valid thing to measure for hockey. But he had no idea how to run a 40. Dude had never run a 40 in his life. Mm -hmm. And he's outrunning 99% oh, yeah. of the NFL's history. Now, how much do you think he could teach you about how to run a 40? Mm -hmm. Bad news. It's fucking nothing is the answer. Mm -hmm. Right? And mm -hmm. there's a lot of that going on in every sport. Mm -hmm. Right? There's mm -hmm. people that are unbelievably talented don't necessarily know much about how to maneuver or how to work the game yet because they haven't done enough meets or they yeah. haven't helped people through enough meets. Yeah. You know? So even people like that, you know, some of them got their hands on the book. Yeah. And they were like, oh, I'm going to try this. This is simpler than what I've been doing or this maybe fits my personality a little better. And they did amazing. You know, people that were more talented did amazing with the more, with the more rudimentary versions of it. Now, as I got into... You know, with higher level people, obviously, I've always used the sequence system, which is a type of periodization. It's, uh, so FIST set is a concurrent periodization model, so in that way, it's similar to, to West Side because we're training multiple characteristics in, in each given block. But the difference would be that we actually do a type of periodization, that sequence system, that's based on rotating the secondary emphasis. So the MSM is what will change. So that's why it's the MSM sequence system. And it's not necessarily that the movement changes. Uh, MSM also is a term that we use within the method for mechanically similar movements. So all of the secondary movements in FISA are mechanically similar movements. And so that's, ne that's necessary. So we can't just call them secondary movements because what if it's pull-ups? That's kind yeah, of yeah, You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Has to be mechanically similar. So that's a rule, and that's the reason 
it's not like I'm trying to make up unnecessary terminologies or rename things that don't need to be renamed. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's the idea. The MSMs will change. So you might have someone doing extremely high rack pulls. We talked about this part last time briefly, mm -hmm. like where they're doing sets of 10 or 12 rack pulls, which seems crazy, but you can't argue with the results because they are doing it from the floor first and then the secondary movement is like, maybe it'll be rack pulls or sumo block pulls. We actually did uh, instructional videos for both of those tutorials. Mm -hmm. So they'll be up on the site soon. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so essentially that's, that was my goal with it. How has it evolved though from so much, you know, because it's, it's been a yeah. long, it's been out for a long time, right? Yeah, so, yeah, you know, so the, <clears throat> I'll take it back to where it started and then we'll go through yeah, the whole evolution yeah, yeah. of it. So it actually started when I was in prison. So I was in, uh, I was in state prison for a number of years and I've always been somebody for whatever reason that people look to. Like, hey, can you show me how to do this? Or I want to do what you're doing. So in jail, I had a, a group of people that I that just kind of followed me around and did what I did for a little bit until eventually I was like, all right, let's make a plan. So I got some old books and mm -hmm. uh, read through them and came up with an, an idea that was based on prolepin, just mm -hmm. meeting the volume requirements because that was all we were able to do in that situation. It's not like we couldn't hardly max. Most of us were too strong to be able to max. So mm -hmm. we ended up doing percentage work and you could only go to this indoor gym that had like basically unlimited weights. You yeah. could only do that maybe once a month and you had to plan for it. So that was how the initial uh, rotation started. It was just a whole bunch of volume mm -hmm. because of the way that, you know, which we were using the protocols that we used in the original book the whole time I was in jail. And then it kind of evolved into, uh, I realized that eventually after two or three mesocycles, everybody not only stalled, but started even though we were having deloads, they were still just getting their ass kicked. Like they were starting to have signs of overuse and so forth. So that was when I realized that maybe we should take a period and, and just do a different kind of training. So we did that and it worked. Uh, later on though, I realized that the best bet with that was to just sort of switch the emphasis towards, uh, you know, absolute strength or maximal strength for a period of time and drop the volume and that became what is now our peaking cycle mm -hmm. and that has over the years evolved you could say in the first iteration in that simple version of the book i had everybody do a, a shorter peaking cycle that was super easy to get through but it started off very heavy and i noticed that especially more advanced lifters had issues with the transition from 80 percent to 90 plus percent weights you know, for some, that's like a magic area where things get really hairy, yeah. you know, if you're not used to doing that sort of stuff. So I found that adding another microcycle in the beginning, which is essentially they're taking singles at 90 and 95 percent of their training max that they've been working with for an extended period as their training max. So those should be easy. So doing that, the first uh, microcycle was good. And then we have a way that you're supposed to approach your attempts. So we do 7% jumps leading up to maxes. So then in the subsequent microcycle, second time through. Let me, pa let me pause just for a minute for those listening yeah. that don't understand. A microcycle is typically going to be a training week or sometimes I think mm. with Fist said it's nine days. Yeah, Some Fist people it's 10 days. It's the sh it's outside of the training day, mm. it's the shortest period in a periodization. You know, then from there, you have a mesocycle, which is usually like a peaking block for me, something like that. And then the macro cycle, which would be a training year, you know, yeah, so just or, so or even half year is how we do macro yeah, cycles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just so they're following when you're saying micro cycle. Is, right, right, right. Okay. And the reason I'm using these terminologies again, I'm not trying to be obtuse here, but it's not a week. So we, we kind of yeah, got yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got away from from the using the micro cycle term because everybody did a yeah, seven they think day. It's a week, but everybody it can, did it a can seven be, day yeah. micro cycle. Yeah. So like, why are you using that? Yeah, well, I know nine. some they'll use 14 days, nine days. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, so it's, over the years, yeah, I've had to. Some people like, for example, when Amit Sapir was doing his that whatever mm -hmm. the fifth world record. Uh, yeah, I had him doing a 10 day mm -hmm. micro cycle, but typically most people we can get away with nine. Yeah, uh, some heavier squatters are the exception. Although, you know, JP, he, he was really heavy with nine. Mm -hmm. He was able to get up to just amazing, amazing total, amazing numbers. I think he totaled 2281. And really, you know, he totaled 23, but that lockout, he got lighted on it. So mm -hmm. I don't know why. Yeah. So back to the microcycles yeah. changing. So microcycles essentially, and that's all laid out in the book too. Mm -hmm. the, the, all these explanations of terminologies and so forth are all very clearly laid out. And there's actually some visuals that explain to you how 
microcycle being the smallest, repeating, meso being the second, mm -hmm. and then macro being the largest. So, um, yeah, so essentially, I forget what I was saying about that. Just the iteration of when you were in prison, you're, the microcycles oh, okay. had to change because... Yeah, at that point, they were, they were weeks. They were weeks, and I realized that everybody was getting so banged up, so I made a couple of alterations to change that. One of the things was the nine-day, mm -hmm. and the other thing was actually moving into a full macrocycle model that involved a peaking cycle. Because when you think of peaking cycle, you think, oh, I'm going to get beat up because I'm doing real heavy stuff. But the amount of stuff that you're doing during a peaking cycle is usually significantly less yeah. than what you'd been doing in the training year prior to that. So mm -hmm. our volume, for example, our volume on fifth set is, is like somewhere in the neighborhood of 30% total of what it is the rest of the year during mm -hmm. a peak. So although the percentages are slightly higher, you actually end up reducing accumulated fatigue that way. Yeah. So that's how I bring people into meets ready to rock. You know, mm -hmm. it reduces the likelihood of injury and everything else too. So mm -hmm. we've had really good success with that. So yeah, so there was that. And uh, so when I, when I uh, started it and uh, then when I got out of jail, I was like, man, I had all these great ideas of all these different implements I was going to use and like different machines. Oh, it's going to be great. I got access to all this oh, yeah. equipment. Yeah. Gonna... And so, and I did, you know, when I got out, I did experiment with all different equipment and different, I'm going to do all these different things. And after about a year or so, I realized like, man, it was working better before. So we, mm -hmm. we kind of went back to uh, a more original, a more bare bones version of it for a little bit and uh, expanded that way. And then over the course of, uh, I guess it's been the last 10 or 12 years or so, I've probably, I've worked with hundreds of lifters, mm -hmm. you know, that most of them, you know, have come and gone, but yeah. some people stay through the whole process. Mm -hmm. You know, I still have like, obviously Sin, I still have uh, Ellen, mm -hmm. you know, Ellen. And it's she, so funny, right? Like even yeah. during like the time period that we've been working together, there's been moments where we're like, okay, we're gonna try this different thing. Yeah, I try the different thing, and I'm like, nope, 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 we're going no. back. <laughs> right? You just yeah, it at seems a certain like... point, you just shouldn't. It it works. Just let it work. It's kind of their yeah. second and third and fourth order effects to every decision you make. It's kind of like we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Like something we change something in a system. <laughs> there's a lot of things that are downstream that are also gonna be. Uh, Unintended consequences might be the best way to refer yeah, yeah, to it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like things that you don't expect to happen and don't want to happen necessarily that are effects of other effects. So, you know, and it's the same thing. It's kind of like that analogy I was talking about before with like coding. If anybody knows anything about coding, if you're like in your fourth line of code and you make a mistake, you get down to your 14,000th line of code and test everything, there might be 9,000 errors. You go yeah. back up, start at the beginning, and get down to that fourth line and you're like oh that's an error and you fix that oh no there's eight more errors so there's only eight errors in the whole thing it looked like thousand because of everything was bouncing off of other things mm -hmm. that were wrong right. and that very same thing happens in adjusting programming frequently you know you'll adjust one aspect of the program and you don't think about how that's affecting everything else you know so what i've done is i sort of distilled everything down to as simple as it can be and still be optimal but no further you know so there are some things that you have to decide for yourself. You have some wherewithal. Some attempt selection is based on bar speed, but you have a range and you have an upper limit. So these, the idea with these things were to develop safeties for coaches. So for people that are just learning and you want to help other people that, are, that maybe know a little bit less than you, although you may not know everything yet, you're able to do that if you have a solid set of rules. Mm -hmm. right? And I can't help everybody. I can't teach everybody myself. Mm -hmm. you know, so there's, when I release the book, the first book, and then obviously Evolutions was a second uh, ebook afterwards. There's a ton of people that started using it. I mean, there's a, there's a ton of gyms throughout the United States that that's what they use with their clients. Like I have, I've done over a hundred seminars, and a lot of those places, this is what they're using with their clients. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're running the method, and they have all these questions about how, what do I do when this happens, or, or I'm having people do this. Is this right? And like, I don't mind answering questions, and I'll answer questions mm -hmm. for anybody that I can. But there's certainly a limit to it. And then, like, what I'm not able to answer, how much of that is negatively affecting your clients? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because it can't be a priority for me to just be always answering everyone's questions that message me. Like, the message requests are, like, 99 plus at all times. Yeah, yeah. You know how it is. It's, it's mm -hmm. impossible. I try. I do what I can, and I do the stories. So that way, when I answer questions on a story, 4,000 people see it instead of mm -hmm. one person asking me a question privately and I answer it. Yeah. So at least it's helping more people, you know? Everything I've done with this has been to try to reach and affect as many people as possible in a positive way. Mm -hmm. That's the goal, you know, and uh, to help. 
So uh, I think we've been pretty effective with that. And I think this is going to be, I'm excited to, for the first group of coaches to pass through this. And uh, Boy, the other thing that we were talking about too, when I can't remember if the last time you were out here or the time before was, you know, with, with the expansion of online training, this is before COVID. So with the mm. expansion of online training before COVID, and you were running into issues because I've, I've always kind of been like this anti-certification guy, right? I mean, really, I have. You know, I'm not going to lie about that. There's a lot of But it was through the one of the po- – yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was through one of the conversations that we had that's – it's definitely on one of the podcasts where you made a statement that, you know, some of the problems that you were running into is people are taking fifths at the same way that they would 531 or other stuff. And then they're working with their own clients using that, mm. which, which is fine. People are going to do that. Mm. But then they're making changes, yeah. you know, to it, which well, is then looking, somebody will go through your, your program, right? Uh, Fifth set. But it's been bastardized for lack of a better way to explain it. Yeah, I like to call that a, like a drop of piss in the whiskey. Yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not your program. You won't taste it, but yeah. it's not as good. Yeah, You're better so, off without it. <laughs> yeah, so it's at that point, you know, the first thing that goes through my mind is, you know, as a business owner is, okay, copyright, you know, this, this mm. is how you protect it. And then you start talking about, oh, I think if I can just certify some of these people, get more people out there. Mm. And then if people do want to actually run through it the way you would have them run through it, right. here's the list of people that can actually run through it. Because I can't take that many clients i can't like even think about it like i said i've had some of these people straight through the whole time and like when i took a year or so ago i took up a thing i put up an ad on facebook and said i'm going to take two clients i got 200 applications yeah so that's how many people what do i tell them good luck well yeah i get that i get that (laughs) but there's also the dilution of the brand too right right right, because people are not doing it properly but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna refer them to someone that's run a fist set with their clients and I don't know that they actually like they say they that yeah and that's book. what was happening yeah, right and that's, right. that's happened to it's, it's happened to Wendler a lot you I know bet. with the 531 as well I bet and you know Jim's Jim but you know, yeah. fuck, you know don't but care. you know yeah. fuck, you know but it's, you're sure. making your living kind of doing this so it's, it's yeah. that that's kind of a way to vet that out so it's right. that kind of changed my perspective it's like okay so now when I'm looking at these other certifications that are out there yeah. It's like, okay, what's the nece- what's the need for it? And why is this necessary? Yeah, well, yeah, it's like, right now, some of them, it does. It's like, okay, this makes sense because this coach has their own methodology. This is how they do things. This makes sense. This one here, ah, no, I don't get it. Yeah, anything know? like that, I think you have to look at it critically. Yes. Like you're saying. It's like, why, wh- what does this give me that I couldn't have otherwise? Yes. What is the value of this cert? And with ours, like, I think it's simple in a sentence, like with the fifth set certification is, you're, you're learning how to be a coach, number one, which is beneficial, and that's great. There's some good general certification stuff in there. Like you learn how to run a coaching business. There's actually the business of coaching that's part of it. But the, the fact of the matter is when someone wants someone, when someone wants to run fist set and a coach tells them, yeah, I can do that, I can coach you through that, which I have a lot of people that do that. And mm-hmm. they ask me, oh, I'm running this with my clients. It's going well, but there's this problem I'm running into. And it's like, well, this guy does not really know how to coach it yet. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that was what I was thinking. At one point, I was thinking, I'll just invite a bunch of these people out to Keyhole and do it there. But then I realized, like, this is something that has to be, like, I need to put together. And in order for me to take it seriously enough to, to put together actually what should be required in that course, what does it really take to, to prove that you actually know what you're talking about? So I knew there was going to have to be a written exam. I'm not doing that stuff at my place yeah I'm yeah just, so i knew it was gonna have to be a written exam so there's a written exam on essentially everything that's in the textbook and it's a real textbook i mean it's it turned out great sin actually did the design work on the book and it turned out fantastic it's an actual textbook so there's a written exam on what's in the textbook which we're going to cover that you know at length in the course and uh one of the things you're going to have to do is be able to write a macro cycle like what we were just talking about mm-hmm. a fist set programming so you're going to have to write a program it takes you from as far out as, you know, six or seven months out into the meet. And you're going to get graded on that. That's part of the written exam. Then there's going to be a movement. There's going to be a practical exam that involves, you know, grading a movement. We have a, in FIST that I use a 4-4 four, four grading system to grade movement. I actually did a, a tutorial video where we went through bench press and I described how that works. So essentially it's just four elements of the movement. 
that I think are crucial for each movement. So, you know, it's not a, it's not a very difficult process, but what's, what, what is important to understand is how to extract what it is that's important about the movement. Because I think if most people look at a lift, they're not looking at the things that are most important in terms of coaching, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really quite simple. It's really easy to narrow it down. Like on a bench press, for example, it's transfer of energy is one of the things. So transfer is one of the biggest things I look at, right? So that's when, I'm, when I say that in a raw bench press, you should have a, a pretty fast ascent, you know, as fast as you're able to stabilize. And uh, that kinetic energy goes down through the legs into the floor. And if you stay driven back and you're in position the way that you should, when you go to press, it's going to fire back at the bar, right? So that's transfer. That's one thing I grade on. Another thing is positioning. So making sure that the person's set up correctly up on the top of their traps, uh, cueing, proper cueing. So reaching, using like the reaching cue, right? Bar speed, bar path. So it's pretty simple stuff, but those are the things that, that make the biggest difference in coaching. Those are the things that you can communicate most easily also to a client. So these are like really, that's really valuable. Mm -hmm. Just the stuff I just said right there in the last like 90 seconds. Yeah. Those, that's what you do as a coach. 90% of what you do is not going to be making up programs. No, know? it's, it, no. <laughs> it's, it's, it's going to be that. Yeah, yeah it's that yeah. simple. People don't know what to look at when they start. So just having that outlined, I think, is also a big thing. Having a system where if you're working with clients, they're going to want feedback. They're going to want to know that you know what you're doing, what you're, so you don't want you to just look at them and say, yeah, up, up, I mean, mm -hmm. when you press, like, yeah, hey, press, press. You know, mm -hmm. that's not, they want to know that they're actually getting something back. Like, okay, this is the ideal. So I start with the ideal. I break down what the ideal or the standard should look like for a movement into cues, right? So then when things go wrong with the movement, those same cues are the way we fix it, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, this was wrong. You only got a three out of four this time. I'm going to give you this cue. Mm -hmm. That's going to fix it. That's going to be our main focus for the next session or the next set. If I'm with you in person, then that's the focus for the next set. Yeah. Right. And then I might give you a grade for the whole session. It's important. And people do need three, four days. If, you, if everybody's like, you're just like, oh, yeah, you're doing great. Like, mm -hmm. You go to sleep. Yeah. You know? But when there are things that are like, oh, this maybe this is a three and a half out of four. There's something, this is what we got to work on. And, you know, next time they're like eating that up the whole week, you know, mm -hmm. like thinking about that. Oh, and then. That's how correction gets made. That's how improvement gets made. You know, you need to have a clear focus on what it is that you're trying to correct. You have to make that, you have to simplify it as much as you possibly can to the person that you're trying to teach. Because they don't know what the hell's going on half the time, you know? No, oh, yeah. It's, they, don't, they don't know what they're doing. Like, oh, what do you mean? Uh, what, tuck elbows? What's, you know, it's, it's confused. So I try to make it as simple as possible. Cues like reaching for the bar with your chest like that. It's an awesome cue. Mm -hmm. Everybody can figure out how to do that relatively easily. If you've seen any of the instructional videos, it's something that is like a night and day difference on your bench press right there. There's things like that for every movement. You know, so I wanted to also incorporate that stuff. I wanted to make sure that everybody, because what if I have someone that really knows how to run the method well and they suck as a coach? That looks bad also. Yeah. So you have to, you know yes. what I mean? They might know every, the ins and outs of how to write programming and they can write a perfect, because there's really, there's not that much to it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, it should be, yes. it's not the science of rockets. You know what I mean? It's not as convoluted as some of these people will have you believe. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, uh, they muddy the water to make it seem deep. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, oh. well, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. part of the beauty of, of you having produced this material and really made it available and accessible to the public. You know, I, I remember that, at least for me starting out, there were tons of people that would be like, I can coach you. Let me be your coach. And if you think about how many people are out there kind of saying that they can do this or they have it, how would I know, right? I'm right, an athlete, right. I'm not, this is not my background. I haven't been doing this for a decade. You don't know who to listen to. Right, you right. don't know what to look for. So even if you wanted to make good decisions, you really couldn't. So I feel like really by putting forth some of these principles and kind of democratizing and making it more accessible to the public, it's also in a way kind of like ensuring more safety in some ways. It, no, absolutely. You know, more credibility. Yeah, like you credibility. Know, yeah. You know how to validate those decisions. You can make more uh, yeah. better informed decisions, so to speak. So that's something that kind of comes to mind a lot. And we've talked about no that. doubt about it. That that's actually that what that's what we're talking about. That's the whole point of this of the certification is to let people know like okay, this is someone that's competent. 
right? Mm -hmm. So the idea of the certification is to demonstrate competence. I'm not going to hold you up. If you come out and take the certification course and you do a horrible job or don't pay attention and you can't demonstrate that you know what you need to know, I don't care that you paid for it. You're not going to get certified. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. You know what I mean? You have to actually, this has to be something that you're pursuing. You know, this has to be something that you're taking very seriously, that you want to learn, you know? And uh, like for me, I'm somebody, I like to learn things because I like to teach things. That's, I mean, that's just what it comes down yeah. to is I love working with people. I love seeing somebody get something that they've been struggling with for an extended period of time. I love that. So how would the people, I mean, from, from your perspective, from what you just said, how would the people that are out there now, because there's, there's, there's many ways to get to the end, right? Mm -hmm. So how, how would they know what is a competent coach or not a competent coach? Well, there's, I can give you a list of clues, but one of the things, if you're talking about someone that's using the FISAP methodology, is going to be the fact that they're certified. Yeah, yeah. Right? So they should have a holistic understanding of programming. That's one thing. But that's not coaching. Mm -hmm. Right? Programming is not coaching. I think that's a, a big misconception. Oh, my coach does this. My coach says this. Does he say it to you, or does he just... If, is this just your program? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? That's, that's like, a lot of conflation, right? <laughs> right, exactly. So coaching is actually, to be clear, is working with a lifter, is teaching them the things that they need to understand to do well in the sport, whatever the sport is. You know, in, in our sport, all we do is bench press, squat, and deadlift, right? So, like, you should be able to explain every aspect of those lifts, you know? You should be able to maneuver. Oh, you should find somebody, rather, I should yeah, say. So yeah. the things you're looking for someone who's able to maneuver through any sort of obstacle, right? As far as how you establish that with someone before doing business with them is very difficult. So I always look to experience that people have had with others, right? So if you're thinking of hiring someone as a coach, the best thing you can look at is the, the experience that the people they have already coached have had. So how did they do, right? Were they, was this a bad experience for them? Is that one person? Is that everybody that you can find? Had a bad experience with them obviously you're not gonna go with that person right uh is there somebody that you know is a headhunter and has like one or two big name clients and that's basically all they've done that's another thing that's a red flag like when i look for people like okay so i'll give you my sort of criteria for taking a client not that i'm you know anything special but that's how this is what i look for in a client is somebody who's motivated already but needs guidance, right? So I'm fortunate, you know, I'm, I'm truly blessed that I'm in a position where I can pick and choose my clients. I know everybody can't do that. Mm -hmm. But to some degree or other, I think you really need to. You know, even if you think it's not the, like, oh, you're, you're worried about, like, making the rent or whatever it is, like, it's not worth it to work with a client that doesn't, that's not motivated. Well, let's, let's backtrack on the motivation real quick, right? Yeah, yeah. Because... I understand what you're saying, but at the same time, the, the, the thing that always goes through my head is that client may tell you that they're motivated. That's why. <laughs> and well, and, but to them, they actually may even be motivated because it's the most motivated they've ever been mm. right. at anything in their life to where mm. I would look at that same person and say, the training that I do now, you know, as a washed up meathead, mm -hmm. you know, my, I'm 20% into it yeah. the way I was when I was competing. Right. That's just a fact. You know, it's mm. not my entire life. Yeah. I'm just putting it out there. But my 20% is way more than what this person yeah. 100% is, but they don't know my 100%. Yeah. Cuz they you see what I'm saying? Yes. yes. So to them they 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 could be completely motivated if they're if the program calls for three training sessions a week and they show up twice. To them, they could be, I'm fucking motivated. I've never been this motivated to do anything before in my life. Right, I'm right. Doing But to them, you see what I'm saying? It's like you're, oh, yeah. it's, it's like when we talk about adversity. The worst thing that's ever happened to you is the worst thing that's ever happened to you. To right. you, yeah. Right, now somebody else could look at them and say, dude, seriously? But to them, it's the worst thing that's ever happened. Right, well, yeah, it's so, all subjective and within context. Right? Uh, yeah, so when we dial back that motivate, you see what I'm saying? It changes that motivation. So you want to know what I do to figure that out? Yeah. Because I've obviously had to run into this and yes. sort through a sea of people that have no idea what they actually want. And the average person does what you're saying, tells me they're going to break the world record, and they're, most, they're, an, they're like a killing machine. Well, exactly. And they're an animal, and you don't understand how bad I want this. And like the thing is, like if you're going to break the all-time world record, you've probably already benched more than 250, bro. 
you're going to figure that out without mm -hmm. me because yeah. I was doing more than that when I was 16 and I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? There are people that are genetically gifted beyond me to an extent that's unimaginable. Yeah. So what I look at is this, right? So I have uh, interview questions yes. that, I, that I give people, right? And this is sort of like, it's a little bit of psychological trickery, but I'm happy to give you a peek behind the curtain. No, I'm not like for, to hear what you're saying because it just interests me. For what I'm looking for. Yeah. Here. Okay, so the questions are, and these are, you know, I'll just blow through these because there's really only a few that matter. Most of them are camouflage. Mm -hmm. Why don't you start by telling me about yourself? What do you do for a living? What's your schedule like? What are hobbies other than lifting? Are you married? Do you have kids? What's your diet like? What got you started lifting? How does your training look? How long have you been lifting? What keeps you lifting? What kind of facility you train in? What meets you planning? Things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, no wrong answers, right? So, and what I want people, the only wrong answer is that you give me a single sentence answer. Mm -hmm. So I give people, the, you know, I'm like, yeah. just show me. And I'll be honest with you, if you're trying to avoid getting crazy people and things like that, mm -hmm. people will show you if they're crazy. Just oh, yeah, give yeah, them opportunity yeah, yeah. to write some <laughs> shit down mm -hmm. <laughs> about mm -hmm. themselves and they'll go off on a tangent or what have you. So out of these, what I look at, right, the only answers that are truly crucial are what got you started lifting? And what keeps you lifting mm -hmm. right and those answers have to establish a need mm -hmm. right so in mm -hmm. other words they have to tell me something to the effect of i realize this is something that i can't function without or i realize that this is something that's an important part of my life it makes me a better dad or makes me a better whatever they find something other than just chasing a number goal because if they're chasing a number goal that's going to go away something will happen Mm -hmm. They'll hurt their knee, they'll get sick, they'll get, you know, they'll miss enough training that they don't want to go through the process of getting back to it, what have you. And these are the people that tell you they're killers, you know, they're killing oh, yeah. machines, they're going to mm -hmm. get world records and all this and that. The first thing that comes up, you know, and quite frankly, that's, that's another reason why you shouldn't, you have no idea what's going to happen. You can see a lifter that's done two or three meets and he's got an amazing total and then he'll be gone next week if he gets injured and you'll never see mm -hmm. him again because he's never had to work through an injury. Mm -hmm. He's never had to come back from an injury. He doesn't have that resilience, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing that I've found over the years that makes the difference between those two things, right, is believe it or not, it's got nothing to do with genetic potential. It's got nothing to do with like how strong you are. It's how badly you need it, right? Because mm -hmm. motivation is fleeting. Mm -hmm. That's it. Some days you're motivated, some days you're not. So that's why I say they already got to be motivated because it's not my job to motivate you. Yeah. I can't motivate someone. No yeah. one can. You can pretend that you're, you're changing and they, they'll react to the things you do and so forth. But it's all, it's sort of like a, it's like a stage play where you're it is. both and playing it, it, their parts. It's not yeah, real. It's no, it's not. And at the, at the same time, it, it has nothing to do with the work that you have to do. Right, right. You're not going to consistently get it done unless you have some internal intrinsic motivation that's forcing you to do it like this is what I do because like we were talking about yeah. during, during the lockdown. And shit, like mm -hmm. you figure out the people that really need this because those are the ones that found ways to get it in. Didn't yeah. make excuses. Like Sin's uh, doing, doing bench presses with, uh, with a bar with plates literally made out of wood. Mm -hmm. And that he was, was squatting awesome. out of a wooden mm -hmm. squat rack. Yeah, and like me, you know, at that time I lived by myself. I'm in Keyhole by myself. I was training every day. My train partner flowers yeah, was still coming yeah. over. We didn't care. We just threw it. You know what I mean? We were getting through it because I realized, like, this is something I need. And when the time, when everything else in the world breaks down, literally when the world shuts down, that's the thing that keeps standing. That's the pillar for me. That's the thing that you can't take that out without everything else crumbling. I can change the way it looks. I can change the way I train. I can change the duration of my sessions, the movements I do, the range of motion, whatever I need. But you can't take it away. If you take it away, we're in trouble. It's bad for me. It's bad for everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and that's what I look for when I'm taking a client. And that's the best way that I can get that information out of people because it's tricky. I'm not asking you, are you going to be a world champion? Do you got what it takes yeah. to be the strongest guy that I've ever met? You know, you don't know whether you have that or not. During my time when I was doing all the seminars, the conjugate seminars, and I was at West Side at the time, there, I don't want to say it was a lot, but it was, it was frequent. You know, people would come up to me afterwards or during the seminar and say, you know, how do I get to West Side? Because if I was at West Side, I know I could be way stronger. And then I would look at them and say, that's exactly why I know you wouldn't be a fit at West Side. Right. You know, because if, if that was right. the case, you would already, you wouldn't be looking for that yeah. motivation. You would already have it. And, yeah. you know, and it would, it would be there because it was, to me, it was a glaring clue, you know, that, 
You yeah. get it. You get a room full of dogs that all have that motivation, though. That's yeah, a, that's a dog fight. You know, that's well, exactly. That's but like they, I fight. mean, if they're yeah, if, you're if right, though. they have this external thing that they need that's mm -hmm. going to be able to try to bring them this mm -hmm. internal yeah. drive that yeah. it isn't. It doesn't work that way. No, it's a performance. That's the thing. Like that's what people like want to travel and train at Westside or travel and train here. You know, yeah. same thing. They travel and train at Keyhole. Same thing. Yeah. People come and they want to show off. They want. I'm like, dude, I don't. I don't want to see you max on something that you're not. Yeah. You know, I mean, did you yeah. train for this? What are you doing? Now, on the other side of that, you'll get people that'll come just because they want to learn. Uh, yeah. Then they come and they're around people that are way stronger than what they are. Yeah. Then they leave thinking, wait a minute, you're not that much better than what I could be, you know, strength wise. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So then they leave and then they, they're, 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 they, their belief changes mm. because their perception of strength has now changed just smack them in the face. How about perception and how that changes your ability to do things, dude? Like, okay, I, I'll give you another really good example of something like that, right? Like Dan Green. Yeah. You know Dan. Mm -hmm. right? So I can remember Dan, like, you know, he and I were close at one point. We were mm -hmm. back in when he was actually doing meets on the regular. We had like eight world record meets back to back, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I can remember like he broke a, a world record that I believe was John Coles. It was 20 years old. Right? And this was a world record that people were vying for at that time, mm -hmm. vigorously. He destroyed it. That thing has been broken 40 times since then. Mm -hmm. It's like he gave permission to everyone else. Yeah. Hey, yeah. a human can do this, you mm -hmm. know? And how many, how many examples of things like that? Oh, there's a here, my mm -hmm. friends are here. I love that guy. There's another one. He just, they give people permission. They see, they're like, oh, oh someone can do that? I, can, I might be able to do that. Yes. You know what I mean? And it really does. It sort of psychologically unlocks it. And then people are doing it left and right. You mm -hmm. realize, like, what was holding all these people back is that they never, they didn't believe a person could do it. Yes. Let alone themselves. Right. Like right. A, a, a thousand pound squat was unheard of. Yeah. Suddenly it's an 1100 pound squat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just, how long did that take? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, think about, uh, like, even Goggins, mm -hmm. right? With, with that, that was the first 1100 pound mm -hmm. squat, right? Yeah, I mean, and that was like in the time when thousand pound squats were tough, mm -hmm. you know, and he jumped ahead. And then suddenly, how many people follow? You yes. know, because everybody sees it, it, like unlocks it. It's like, see, you can do this, mm -hmm. you know, or can you do this? That's the question, you know, sometimes. Yeah, that so question, do you believe you can? I mean, yeah. there's a lot of things that fall into that, mm. you know, so you getting back to the people that are looking for a coach, there were a few things that you were getting, you know, mm. going down through. So the first one was, you know, the, the technique, you know, what kind of clients do they have? Right. Or what what's, their tra what's their track record of coaching right, people? Right, right. Do they I, understand how to use, first I would say, do they understand how to do programming? That's simple though, yeah. but that's step one. Yeah. Are they able to write effective programming? And you have to sort of have, it's worth reading a book yeah. about it. So you I have to sort of have an understanding that yeah. like a lot of what you're talking about when you're saying like how you source like good clients the inverse is completely true for people that are looking for great coaches sure right like because sure. mm -hmm. you're looking for a lot of the similar things like why do you do what you do mm. because if it really is like i want to net like four world record whatever right yeah. like i couldn't even tell and you I'm how like many a world normal, records we have. yeah <laughs> but it's like if i'm like a normal person so yeah. to speak right normal amounts of responsibilities like I'm investing in you in the same way that you're investing in me and I'm looking right. for that accountability, right? So, right. and in a lot of ways, I think it's super ideal to be able to find somebody that has solid programming background, right? mm -hmm. solid mm -hmm. technician, solid yeah. everything, right? But if you think about the four buckets, right. it's about prioritizing what is important for you. Cause like, no, I'll be right, very right. honest with you. I've had more than a handful of people and when you opened up your slots, reach out to me and ask me what my experience was with you. Right, right. right? That's like, example. That's how a good sweet example. is a coach? You know, like as they Asian, should. Right. As they should. Yeah. yeah. No. Do your homework. Like you should know who you're, who you're signing up for. Yeah. That's how you should shop. Is like what is other people's experience, and also yeah. why do they do what they do? Yeah, why do coaching they do? is such a why? acts of service kind of thing? It's how, a very thankless. Well, uh, how thing are sometimes. they? How are they motivated? How are they motivated? Because there are a lot of people that are very. Uh, they're, they're motivated for selfish reasons. They want to, they're like glory hounds. You know what I mean? Like I want to coach a bunch of world record people. Like notice on the list of things I told you that I look for in clients, none of them are strength. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I yeah. don't care if you're strong because wherever you're at, we can get better. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. And I, I, I don't pick people selectively. I don't headhunt. I don't care what your total is. 
You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I pick people based on the criteria I just said. Yeah. And as a result, I end up with a bunch of people that are, you know, amazing lifters and do all time numbers and so forth. And like, she's at, at rum that, that year at rum, Danny won and you got second, right? So I mean, it was like it most is. of the podium. <laughs> I'm, I can't even, I can't talk about who this was, but I remember one of the most interesting questions or interesting points that was made by somebody that reached out. Mm. They were like, they're like, hey, you know, you've been working with him for a long time. You know, you're not like, holding world records or anything. I'm like, cool, thanks. I really needed to hear that. Feels good. Um, but, you know, this person was also like, yeah, you know, I also know that he works, you know, he worked with like JP Carroll and all these other people. Mm. Does he treat you with the same amount of respect? And do you get the same amount of bandwidth yeah. from him? And I was like, yeah, of course. You know, and I was like, wow, that's like super telling because until that question conversation came up, it, never like that thought never even occurred but i'm like yeah that's a really great question to ask right well what other questions should people ask if they're vetting the coach and they're going to do what you're talking about they're going to reach out to one of their clients and they're going to ask that referral right basically mm -hmm. so those are good questions right there you know mm -hmm. what's your history you know what type of you know respect you know or not really respect a, are, are you given the same amount of time as the, the top person? Right, right, right. You know, so what are the other questions they should ask these people when they're reaching out? In so, regards to any coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the other, the, some of the things that I was kind of, I, I really spent a lot of time thinking about, aside from all this, was also like, is there, is there like a clear framework? Because I always feel, and I'm probably catch heat for this, but I always feel some type of way about people that say that they do 100% custom programming all the time right well, what does that mean what yeah. exactly does that mean and why is it like a hundred percent custom well, right like they're are, either really bad at it or they're lying right <laughs> i just I, I i take offense to people that feel the need to to, to lie about something yeah. in so, that regard and that, i think the most important question that you could ever possibly ask is like to under to, to talk to somebody that had that experience and to ask, hey, you know, what were your objectives? What were you trying to accomplish when you first started working with this person? How did that change? Did you meet your goals? Or did this person help you think through what that next, what that next step should be? Which sounds very like mushy or whatever, but it's very mm. important to know that there was something that you wanted to accomplish when you yeah. reached out to work with somebody. Did that change? I think that's a big question, yeah. though, because I, I bet most people who are reaching out haven't even considered what they're actually really looking for long term. But maybe that's the problem, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, it, then it becomes a fishing expedition. Mm -hmm. Well, honestly, I would prefer that over the other, where they're certain that they're going to be the next uh, all-time world record mm -hmm. holder. I'm saying, like, I want to be an all-time world record holder, but I think no, no, certainly just, there's something yeah. to be said for, for example, somebody saying, hey, I want to learn how to bench. I don't know how to bench. There I've gone go. through five different people learning how to bench. Step one, learn how to do the lifts. Right. That's no. a good. That's a good thing. I mean, like it sounds like laughable, right? But, right, but, but how many how many people do you think come to you for oh help with power? Yeah. And you're like, but if you learn how to like... do these lifts, that would help. That's step one. Right. There's yeah. no special program or drug cycle that's going to make you amazing at lifting. You have to get good at lifting. Well, and there's still, and at the same point, there has to be a certain degree of personal responsibility. Correct. Right. You know, it's, what, the one thing that drives me fucking crazy is, you know, the, the lifters that will say, oh, "Why don't I, I? My coach takes care of all that. I don't even worry about it." Like, so you don't fucking care, yeah, right? Because that, that, so you really don't want to get that much better. Mm. You yep. know, no, I, they, they, he takes, you know, or she or whoever takes care of all that. You know, I just do what I'm told to do. So you're an idiot and you don't care about where you're going, you know, because they should be doing their due diligence right. at all times no. if they want to be able to be the best of their ability. I like in finding a coach to exactly how I look at looking for my next job, like my next boss my next, you know, my, my partner, the, the same basic vetting process was kind of mm. in place, right? Who are you? What are your principles? Mm. Do we align here, right? Yeah. What is the objective? Are we all working towards a common goal, right? And are you mm. gonna tell me that I'm being batshit fucking crazy when my goal doesn't make any freaking sense? And even more importantly, mm. am I willing to listen to you? Yeah. Because I think like, 
Well, that's coachableness that's, is such a hard thing to find in, in other in other people. That's that's the whole thing, man. Is I'm I'm figuring those things out. And honestly, as a coach, anybody that's a good coach, you have to figure those things out about the client too. Yeah, you it's know? a it's an equal playing field like, as far as I'm concerned. Picking right. a coach is one thing, but like you really, I can't emphasize this enough. There's so many people that are worried about like making enough money so they never turn a client away. Some clients are going to waste your time. They're going to make you less of a coach for other clients. It's better not to work with those people. So you have to find out what I have, this is what I have to offer. I know what my skill set is, right? So everything I have here is I'm a, I'm a coach. Like I go as far as to say I'm a good coach, right? I have everything in here that I need to know in that, in that survey for, to, to get the clues I need to extrapolate, are you the kind of person that I want? that I'm going to be able to help. Because mm -hmm. the thing is, if I can't help you, then I'm useless and I suck at my job. I don't want to suck at my job. Yeah, I want well, to what is Sin is saying, though, is it's, yeah. she has to have her own list and yeah. the clients have yeah. to have their own list. Yeah. Clients need to that alignment. That and then where's yeah. the alignment on those lists? Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, that's, yeah, yeah. that's key. Where, no, I agree, that's crucial. Especially in the landscape that we're dealing with, because you have mm -hmm. a lot of lifters who are coaches that, to be quite frank, they're just, they want to make enough money to pay for their drugs, travel expenses, and stuff yeah. like that, and that's it. Yeah. You know, it's heartbreaking. They that's... have like OnlyFans where they send out programming. <laughs> so but that, that's basically. every profession. Yeah. I, mean, it's, I mean, every profession has, you know, shitty and good mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah, uh, the whole range. And there's so something to it, too, because, yeah. I mean, like, there's people that will buy that, you know, that programming and have no actual coaching from the coach, and they'll do well. And they'll be like, look, this guy helped me. And it's, it's hero worship. You know what I mean? Yeah. I understand it. You're like, oh, this is my coach. Like, he's your hero, bro. Just say mm -hmm. he's your hero. He's not coaching you. Yeah. You, know what you I mean? really have the, the, like, the sweetness without bitterness, right? Like, you kind of yeah. need to have, like, a frame of reference. And I'm not saying that's, yeah. like, a great thing, right? But to your point, there is a range. There is a range. Right? Yeah. You can actually decide which part, which side of that you kind of want to be on and start yeah. nudging in the direction yeah. that you want to. But I think that, like, finding really like treating finding a coach with with much more respect and much more due diligence is so important because you're not fucking looking for a pair of shoes no you're yeah. right you know, you're I gonna think... work with this person for a while whether that's like a year like six months a year two years or 10 years right that's a long freaking time and that person can have a lot of impact and influence on how you develop and grow as a person let's be honest like been in the sport for any amount of good time it fundamentally changes the way you look at things and who you become as a person yeah you know you find the right coach it's you know similar to finding like a really great hiring manager a really mm -hmm. great partner right they will bring out the best in you mm -hmm. but if you make a bad <laughs> you if you can't get out of a, a bad situation fast enough right they'll also bring out all the bad things in you air quotes mm. Yeah, I, I would yeah. say, like, you know, because it can be difficult without getting too far into abstraction, I would say, like, a hard list to summarize everything. Yeah. Somebody that's proficient with programming, that has a, you know, a history and has proven themselves as being able to program. Somebody that has a history of technical correction, somebody that's a good technical coach that can help with technique and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. And then somebody that, for all intents and purposes, that you're going to be able to, like, get along with. Somebody that you have to be able to look to the person and respect their opinion in order for yeah. them to be your coach. So if there's any question about whether or not you're able to do that, don't hire them yet. I would arguably you know say I mean? also like a, a coach with like a proven track record of being able to yeah. bring well, people successfully through well, needs. That's what I mean. Yeah. So like all of those things, <laughs> how, you, how, how do you qualify those things? How do you qualify someone knows what they're doing with programming? Well, they've worked with somebody that you know of for an extended period of time that peaked and did what they were yeah. supposed to at a meet, right? And actually finished the meet. Right. I, you know, some days, everybody and has then, bad days, but did you get through it? Yeah, and then the, <laughs> the tech proficiency would be that you know of someone or you can find someone who had issues with tech that were able to be cleared up by working with that coach. Yeah. Yeah. Those two things right there, you're knocking 90% of the, the yeah. bozos out of the mix. It's technique, yeah. I mean, to you know me, know technique I mean? is huge, right? To, to, yeah. Under my umbrella, my bias, you know, the, the, all the weak points are technical physical or mental it's, it boils down to that mm. but you know it's there's an old saying that says skills pay bills mm. right so if you go back to um very very small children you know soccer you mm. know grade school soccer or stuff like that you have the kids that do really well right mm. and the coaches throw them out on the field and because they're genetic outliers they learn fast whatever it's going to be they only 
So they play the best players right. because they want to win JV football or, mm. you know, junior soccer or whatever it is. Meanwhile, these kids that are sitting over there on the bench on the sidelines the whole time, what the coach is saying indirectly, at least you, when I was doing it, is go practice your skills. Mm. Go practice your skills. Go practice your skills. So what happens if you look at how athletes progress through childhood, through high school, the outliers in grade school and junior high usually never play in high school because they never learn the skills. They didn't have to work for right. it. But these other kids yeah. that all they were told, work your skills, work your skills, work your skills, they mature. Because the only reason the other kids were playing sooner is they matured faster. Right. They were bigger, faster, stronger. Now these other kids have not mastered their skills, but have right. done thousands and thousands and thousands Repetition. of repetitions right. on those skills. <laughs> then the little fuckers mature. Yeah. And yeah. then they start kicking the shit out of the other people. Yeah. yeah. And then the other people quit. Yeah. And then they fade right. away. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that's why, you know, skills pay bills. Yeah. So if, if in, in powerlifting, it's the skill of the movement. Yeah. The is movement. Huge. I was going to say that. Yeah. yeah. Like in powerlifting is a little more simple than something like football or track. But there's or still like skills. That. But there's right? definitely skills. And yes, if you take but, care of that at the bottom and you get the <clears> repetitions in, you know, then that's yeah. one less thing they need yeah. to worry about. That's what I was going to ask you. Have you run? But it's different because in powerlifting, there's plenty of people that their skills are pretty shitty still mm -hmm. and they're unbelievably strong there's outliers there's definitely <laughs> right, outliers. because those are like that's what i mean so in certain sports like where there's actually a lot of high skill sports mm -hmm. track baseball things like that or football great example you know those are the situations where like someone the outlier might present early and then they kind of fizzle off because they never have to yeah. learn the, te the technique and so forth but like in powerlifting it seems like those people are catapulted to the forefront and then later on, they end up either learning the technique or they don't. Yes, you and if they I mean? don't, it's, it's, it's how they miss at that point, right? That's how they end, yeah, right? prematurely. So they, they either end, you know, out of injury, or when they miss, it's just out of a groove miss. Yeah. They can't strain yeah. through anything because yeah. they're not in a position to strain through. Right. They haven't trained right. it. Yeah, they haven't trained it. Exactly, yeah, they haven't trained it. So they, they, in the long run, they decrease their longevity and they decrease their highest end potential. Now, their genetic, I mean, genetics and all these other things play a huge role, the right? Biggest so, role, you know, yeah. it, can, it can throw them, you know, to the top. But when it's, and a lot of the times what happens with those people, because I know them well, very well is, as well, because I've seen those, is for them to actually progress, even at that higher level, they're going to have to decrease. Yeah, they have to step back and they back can't and take it. Out. Yeah, they it's, mentally, that's when you find out. That's when you find yeah. out if they're going to make it or not, is if they can be humble. They can humble yes. themselves and say, okay, I don't already know everything. Because what happens is a guy will do a meet and get a crazy good total or something like that. And the technique's horrific. He looks mm -hmm. like he's about to die. But he's like, now nah, I'm just going to do more at the next meet. <laughs> and, you know, if well, that's yeah. your first or second meet, if that's your 20th meet, then okay. If that's your first or second meet, like, you need a lot more practice, man. Like, and, yes. and how many people want to dial it back and practice? You know, and, it and may like, mean dialing it back competitively. I mean, their lifts might fall, look, you know, 100 at, pounds for six months look before at JP. it comes back. Yeah. It's a great example. He yeah. actually went down on his squat, but, I mean, he actually went down on his squat. That's why. Because mm -hmm. he actually squatted to death. Mm -hmm. But, like, he was willing to humble himself and work for a little bit at those lower weights and, mm -hmm. and work on technique and refine things and build. And he came back and blew his stuff out of the water by 100 pounds. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because he was willing to do that. If you're not willing to do that, you're going to hit a wall, and the first time you hit that wall, your pride's going to get in your way of getting over it. It's too heavy. You can't carry the pride over the wall with you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you can well, either yeah. throw the pride over and, and meet it on the other side when you get there, or you can you know, leave the pride behind and get yeah. over there. You know what I mean? To, There's no way yeah. to carry it. To stay you. on the same path here, yeah. you know, let's talk about a meet, right? Because mm. one of the questions that I always get for whoever's out here is a beginner will say, you know, I, I, what, I, I'm getting ready for my first meet. What advice do you have? Now, not in prep, just for the meet. Say mm -hmm. meet day, meet week, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But I want to actually extend the conversation and talk about the beginner, then the intermediate, then the advanced. Okay. Because it, it, it changes. The, like the, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're vastly different. Very it different becomes needs. a very hard question mm -hmm. that I'll get because you don't have the context. Hey, I'm getting ready to do my first meet. You know, well, first meet, like, like how strong are you? Like, what, what, where is this? Or I'm getting ready for a meet. How do you approach it? And you've been, you know, competing for ten years. 
Where now you're getting for a meet, you might be trying to break a world record. So you got Ellen, right? Which That's is totally way up here. Yeah, it's a totally yeah. different game. Yeah. So let's go with the, the first, the complete total novice beginner, never competed before. Meet day advice. Forget about the week before. You know, Shame, just, shameless plug in yeah. the book here. We have yeah. we have a section called Meet Day. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> it's uh yeah, and that is I think that's important stuff to cover, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest things is getting there on time, right? Like that's the day of the meet, not talking about weigh ins or anything else, but get there early enough, you know. Try to get an idea and figure out you can talk to somebody, the meet director, if you've never if you've never competed before there or whatever, what have you, if that's a person that's your contact, you can say, hey, do you have any idea what time my flight will be or what have you? Get there way before that. Be ready and warming up and getting ready before, long before you need to, right? Get into one of the racks because people are always fighting for racks to warm up. And if you're a new person, you're not going to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And they're going to just go right around you and you'll be like, oh, can somebody, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, you know. The best advice I can give you is to have somebody that's been through a meet before come to the meet with you and handle you. Everybody can't do that. Mm -hmm. you know? So the best bet I can, the best uh, secondary version of that that I would give you is show up early enough that you got time to mess up and figure things out. Mm -hmm. right? So get there early. As much as you think a little more sleep's gonna help you, it's not gonna help you as much as being warmed up for squats is gonna help you. Right? You don't wanna have to take two attempts and then run up onto the platform because you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. That's one, the timing aspect of it is probably the most difficult thing for new people. That mm -hmm. seems to be the thing that people mess up on the most. Right, so getting in and just maybe start taking the bar. Like before people are warming up for your flight, start taking the bar. You can take it as many times as you want. Take the bar once, take the bar twice, take it again. And then as a rotation starts, you're in the rotation of people that are warming up. So that's one big thing out of the way. Another thing is nerves, right? People are nervous. Like it's, this might be your first time lifting in front of a group of people, like in front of people, right? You're getting literally judged. Like there's actually three separate people staring at you judging your lift. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, that's, that's for some people, that's, uh, that's intimidating. Right. Feels weird. Feels yeah. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's, 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 uh, you have to sort of look, the biggest thing is in the morning, you have to get something in your stomach. Right. Yes. You have to be realistic that probably your first meet, the judges aren't going to like everything you do. You're going to learn, you look at it as a learning experience. Right. I think if you go into it with that, have a little something in your stomach. Some people, like to sit down and eat a giant breakfast before meat. Personally, me, I like to drink my calories before meat because I know it's going to be, if I'm chewing, I might be like, you know, be stressed out. If I get stressed out, I'm trying to get stuff stuck in my throat and force things down and who knows whatever else is going on. Get hydrated, get a meal in you. First thing, as soon as you wake up, start warming up as soon as you get there. Always be sipping, always be sipping something to drink. Keep fluids in you throughout the day. Stay hydrated. Uh, make sure that you provide yourself enough time to warm up for each lift. That's another thing. People end up having to rush through their warm-ups in order to make it in time just because they don't understand how meets work, right? Mm -hmm. So another good idea might be attend a meet before you compete in one. Watch what happens. Try to get an understanding for the, the cycles of like, well, you know, what is a flight? What's a session? You know? What does that mean if they're on their second attempts in, in this flight and I'm in a flight that's two flights away? These are things you have to get a handle on. If you mm -hmm. don't understand how that stuff works, it's going to be a really shitty experience for your first time at a powerlifting meet. You're going to be embarrassed and you might not do it again. So that was kind of, that's part of the thinking. Like actually that first book, a lot of that information was aimed at people that had never done a meet. Like mm -hmm. I want you to not feel stupid. You also you know? wrote like a, a whole article about this. I remember after one of the, Early, a one couple. of the first meets that we did. A uh, couple articles. And maybe it would be good for you to talk a little bit about what warm up shouldn't actually be. Yeah. So you shouldn't be taking any attempts that you're going to take on the platform mm -hmm. in the warm up room. That might seem self evident, but apparently it's not because I see people doing it like fucking all the time. Yeah. Like, like I just got to make sure I got this. Like, no, you're, you're not going to have it. If you get it back here, you're, the chances of you getting it on the platform dramatically reduce. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So just save that. Uh, I, I say a good rule of thumb also is to do 7% jumps. So whatever it is that you decide is your opener, right? Keep in mind that if you're going to jump 20% from there, you're probably going to fail the next attempt, right? So you have to open heavy enough, even though it might be scary to open with something that who feels secure with over 90%, they're definitely going to get it. If you've done a number of meets, you're going to feel secure. If you haven't, you're not, you know? So I think that's another big thing is uh, 
being realistic with the jumps and knowing like, oh, I, you should not open at a very low opener. So then you can make a huge jump and probably miss the second attempt. You know, so there's, those are, there's, a, there's a bunch of pitfalls and things that you run into. Those are definitely big things I've seen. I see those repeatedly at meets. People opening extremely low because they're scared they're going to bomb out, which I mean, hey, open low enough that you're not going to bomb out. But we should be able to get a handle on what that number is before you're at a powerlifting meet. Right? Like we should be able to say, Well, you would okay. think as long as their depth is on point. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and all the other kind tech, of stuff. Tech stuff aside. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. And there are going to be little deviations and things where, hey, man, if you miss based on a, a tech thing, like where you miss depth a little bit and it's your first meet, I mean, these are the things you live and learn, man. In training after that, don't make excuses. Yeah. <laughs> make sure you're hitting depth in training. That's another huge thing I see is people, you know, they're like, oh, it'll be there at the meet. It'll be there at yeah. the meet. Depth will be there at the meet. And then they get lighted. Oh, I can't believe I. I've seen. Well, even with I've the first, training yeah, for even, two months. Even with the opener, though, if 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 you're there and you're watching how the judges are calling, mm. right, and then you're like, oh shit, this is way deeper than I would normally go, assuming that they trained to parallel or a little below. Mm. Some meet, some judges gonna be like, holy shit, you know, this is that opener needs to be set at such a level that you can mm. actually go all the way to the fucking floor if you have to. Yeah, and that's yeah. kind of that's that's something that's within the methodology. That's how we have that covered. So you're not. The thing is, like, you have to be. And one of the things I recommend to everybody, regardless of where you're at, if you're a coach, if you're a lifter, whatever the reason is that you're lifting, video your freaking lifts. And there were people. I remember when I was young and I started lifting. There were people carrying giant video cameras into the gym to to video their squats with like those eight those you know those eight mm -hmm. millimeter tapes. Like everybody on earth has a high def movie maker in their pocket right now. Mm -hmm. There's no excuse. There's no excuse. Even if I'm working with a client, I set it up and record it. And then I look at it, I'm like, look, see? And you can show them, you know, you can. So you should be clear on what depth is. When you're taking a peaking cycle, which is what we use in FISET to determine what the numbers are that you're gonna take in the meet, mm -hmm. right? The peaking cycle is part and parcel of that whole deal. That's actually the information that we take. And based on that, we blow out with that formula what your first, second, and what the upper limit for the third would be based mm -hmm. on what you did. If you do that, you should get all three attempts. Now, stuff happens. Like you said, there's, mm -hmm. there's uh, tech things that'll happen. You, you miss depth, so forth. But we do everything in our power to prevent that before. That's the shit you worry about before you get to the meet, mm -hmm. right? You're not going to improve your technique on meet. No, 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 no. You know what I'm saying? No, You're not, not going to learn how to squat the depth mm -hmm. on meet day. So this should be something that you've been doing like ad nauseum, right? To the point where you're like, all right, I'm obviously i'm at depth and in, in all fairness like if you're looking at your own videos and you're getting yourself ready for a meet you got to be real with yourself you know what i mean you got to be hard on yourself the way that you know a coach would be this ain't depth mm -hmm. oh it's close oh it's on the if it's on the line it ain't depth you know what i mean so i'm not saying you should squat to the basement on something when that's not necessary mm -hmm. when you're actually at depth we have a pretty clear definition of what depth is right top surface of the knee cre mm -hmm. crease of the hip it's that simple right so look at it from the side view put the camera there it's either at that point or it's not right yeah. so that's all there is to it if you can look at it and say with a straight face oh yeah that's that's at that point you know most judges are going to go with you on that mm -hmm. they're going to say yeah okay that's right that, that's what you're going to end up getting but if you're lying to yourself and it's ego that's allowing them, you make you're allowing your ego to make decisions for you. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. Ego is the biggest obstacle with this stuff, man. It's because yeah. people attach it to their identity and their value. This is who I am. I'm, I made this lift. It's something you did. I think mm -hmm. that's like my favorite thing, though. Like every time that we've ever done a meet, before the first attempt of each lift, you'll always say to me exactly like. We trained it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Trust your training. That's all you need to hear. Being on the platform mm -hmm. is definitely not a good time to try to do something new. Like, it's uh, not going to mm -hmm. be there. <laughs> We're not going to do any new shit on yeah. the platform ever, except for maybe a maximal figure. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is a new number. This is as new as yeah. it gets yeah. on the platform. Yeah. Everything else, we better know it inside and out by then. And that same thing, I would take that out and just dial it back for someone at their first meet. Mm-hmm. Practice. You don't feel like you're ready for the meet? Well, how many weeks have you been training? Right. Ten weeks? That's a lot of squatting. That's a lot of bench pressing, a lot of deadlifting. What don't you feel like you're ready to do? Mm -hmm. Right? Are you, so, and, and honestly, like, if you ask yourself those questions, 
you're gonna, it's going to immediately become evident to you what it is that needs to change. You're going to know, like, oh, some of my squats are high. I don't know if I could really do that. I don't know if I could do this weight to depth. I don't know if I could do this with a pause. I don't, yeah. know, I don't know if I can lock that out without hitching, things like that. Like, you, you know in your head, mm -hmm. you know? If you're hitting those lifts clean, you're doing what you're supposed to do. See, I lay it out and make it real simple for you. If you're doing this, this amount and you're meeting this volume requirement, you're doing good. You're going to keep getting better. Right. Yeah. As long as you're nailing that stuff and doing all the tech things you're supposed to. So in other words, you're meeting your volume requirement according to prolepin and the focus is on doing it with proper technique. As long as you're doing that for an extended period of time, you've got a lot of really good practice. You've, you've greased that groove of having a decent bar path, having enough depth, you know, everything that mm -hmm. you need to be able to do in competition. As far as the pause aspect. I think it's overstated. People training for pauses. I've never had any issue with someone on yeah. the bench. On the bench yeah. press, yeah. I mean, for a raw bench press, I mean, it's it shouldn't be a long pause. So if you can get it to your chest quickly and you can should demonstrate control, you're going to get that press command pretty quickly. You know, because most yeah. people that are sitting in that judge chair aren't trying to be dicks. Well, some federations are going to have a start command and a rack command. Too. That too. That too. Yeah. You know, so Which even is... for the squat, they should be practicing the rack command True. and all these other things. And we do that through the peaking cycle. That's actually mm -hmm. that's part and parcel of the peaking cycle is mm -hmm. that you do it with commands, doing certain micros, you know, and that's that's all laid out real clearly. You know, it's practice. You, you this has to be done with commands. So start whatever it has in the mean. So start command, press command, rack command. You have to wait for all those. You jump any of them, you didn't get that. Yeah. Get ready because that's going to be embarrassing at the meet. Yeah. Right. So that's the sort of thing that having that practice, that specific practice, that specificity is, is crucial. It's yeah. important. You know what I mean? I think that's what gives people the confidence that have never done it before. They've only maybe certainly like, you know, never put together a good total. I know people have done five meets and they've they're they're, they're going like, you know, four for nine or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Then, <laughs> that's the average they're getting. Yeah. In this. They have no idea what they're going to hit or not hit out of their mm -hmm. attempts. But we get it to where we're, we're pretty much almost all the time at least eight for nine mm -hmm. you know and uh i think you can do that if you if you have a good handle a good feel of the numbers because we used a, a regression analysis to figure out what was working and what wasn't working you know we changed i told you about the bench press we had to change that pretty significantly over a percent mm -hmm. in terms of what the third attempt was but that's been corrected and there's just i'm not even collecting data for it anymore it's good I yeah don't, i don't think it needs to be any better than it does I uh, yeah i would also say for the for the true beginner that you know, when you when you go to the meet to weigh in, you know, is that is first off, is it the same location you're going to be competing in? Mm. And if it is the same location that you're competing in, fine. Ask the meet director if it's not already set up. Where's the platform going to be? Where's the warm up room going to be? You know, just look and see. Right. So that way you know where everything's going to be. It also puts you in a state to where you can think about the lifting because you're going to be thinking about it all night anyhow. So I don't want to say visualization because people don't understand or don't know how to do that. But you're going to be thinking about the lifting. At least this way, you're going to be thinking about the lifting in the context and the environment you're actually going to be in, which is going to mentally reinforce that a little bit better. And then just blindly walking into a room that you've never been in before. You know, the other thing would be um, I would always get to the meet site the day before. And you, that's how, I mean... Yeah. I'm going way back and dating myself now because we used to have same day weigh-ins. So I wanted to be there the day before. Even if I couldn't get in the building, I wanted to look at the building. Where, where is it? How do I get there? Is there going down some back alley street that I can't find? Because I don't want to stress out and worry about that in the morning. In the morning, yeah. not the time. Yeah. No, in the morning, I just want to be able to wake up, get there, you know, be, be as close to the location as possible. Now, granted, a lot of the first meets are going to be in their own town, so they're going to know how to get around. But as you said, be there early, get there mm -hmm. early. So if it means it's in a different city, I wouldn't be driving three hours, you know, the, oh, that same yeah. day. No way. You know, yeah, I'd be no. going the day before, find the meet site, weigh in. The other thing is let other lifters there know that it's your first meet. They'll help. Yep. Don't be a, um, don't be a, what I want to say, um, when they bother the fuck out of lifters. and with, mm. Don't be too needy. Yeah. yeah. Just say, look, you know, this is my first meet, you know, can you help me out a little bit? Yep. And mm. I don't, I know very few lifters that are not going to, that are going to say, leave me the fuck alone. Mm. You say, no, nah, man, it's fine. Here, here's what you do. Here's, you know, this. And then somebody will help you. Yeah. 
always it happens yeah. all the time too like coaches will contact other, their their lifters that are just happen to be spectators at the meet mm-hmm. and they'll be like yo i have so and so there can you just keep an eye out i do well it there's some vicious yeah. shit though that happens too and the lifters need to be aware of this yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. there's a lot of coaches will go to meets as their way of marketing to siphon yeah lifters that too you know so they'll go to yeah. tons of meets because at the meet there and where coaches get concerned is an online coach is working with somebody then they send them in this meet they don't want to have another coach go help them because they think that coach is going to steal their You're client. Steal oh, them. yeah, I no, that's that. not what I said. <laughs> I know that, <laughs> yeah. but it can, it can happen. Yeah, now, no, I, I mean, know what you mean. Yeah. So what a lot of coaches will do is they will try to find somebody there to be able to help them somewhat just to be able to take care of them, but also out of yeah. paranoia right, 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 that, right, you know, right, this right. person, you know, you don't want to, you know, so there's that. Yeah. But the lifter needs to know this if they're working with a coach. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a high probability another coach is probably going to try to poach them. Tell them shit's gonna be fucked up. It's gonna be wrong. It's it's the sport, man. It's what so it's become. Wild. Yeah, the poaching it, aspect of that is just mind blowing to me. Like, who, how could you be that desperate for clients? Well, uh, again, well, it's like glory hunts. It is, yeah. but so it, I mean, it happens, good, yeah, right? It does so happen. You're right. And it, and it may not be a bad thing, you know, because maybe the person is looking for a coach. And then there's a way to kind of vet that because if they're seeing this person's working with his number of people, they're all having a good day. It looks good. I'm not saying you make the decision there, right. but there's somebody on the radar to be able to kind of vet that a little bit. Mm. Um, but the help will always kind of be there for that, especially for a true beginner. Now you keep doing that crap, you know, 20 meets in. Yeah. You know, <laughs> people know each other at meets over a period of time. They're going to be like, dude, look, are you ever going to bring somebody to fucking help you? <laughs> yeah. You know? Like not having a hand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, like, I, f- I feel like I'll say one thing about powerlifting that's different than most any other sport I've ever been involved in, actually different than any other sport. There is a sort of solidarity among, in terms of people willing to help other people. They have no idea who they are. They have nothing in common with other than lifting. Mm-hmm. If you're at a meet and you show up, like I can tell you me, for example, like I've been doing this a really long time. If I see somebody at a meet, and it's clear they don't know what they're doing, but they're willing to ask for help. Mm-hmm. I'll do whatever I can. That's not going to affect negatively yep. the right. clients I'm handling. But mm-hmm. I'll do anything I can. I'll give them good advice. Go over there, do that. Mm-hmm. Go do that right now. You know what I mean? I'll mm-hmm. help you. I'm going to help you make sure you're okay. You know? mm-hmm. And I and I've I've always said that too. Like if I'm going to be at a big meet, I usually post. If this is your first meet, mm-hmm. you know, like a large meet. I mean, if this is mm-hmm. your first meet, I'm I'm going to be there. Don't be afraid to come up and and say hello and, and say hello. And obviously, I'm not. I'm not looking for clients, yeah. you know, I'm not going to take them. Mm-hmm. But I mean, the point is like, I have people that I, my only interaction with them has been that I helped them at their first meet. I never coached them, but they were there and, and I'm mm-hmm. still friends with them. Mm-hmm. Like we're people that still have a lasting relationship that's lasted 15, 10 years, something like that, whatever, however long, where like, I was at your first meet, dude. You remember that when I helped you, like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I helped you wrap your knees or I told you to go up there cause it was time to squat. Like, and that's, that's good. One thing that's awesome about powerlifting, and that's kind of what I was getting at, is like I can remember there was a time, there was one meet well, that we would regularly do, Keyhole Team in New York. It was right outside of New York. I think it was North Jersey. Oh, yeah. But there's like a team from West Philly of like, you know, gangster dudes from West Philly. There's Wait. Keyhole Barbell, all of us oh, in there. Oh, they're so great. All the, and then there's like a Catholic high school, and there's like six or seven different huge groups, right? And nobody has anything in common other than powerlifting mm-hmm. but everybody's got each other's back everybody is cheering for each other you know it makes no difference like sort of like race creed background all that stuff it really doesn't matter if you're lifting and you're doing it correctly and you're giving 100 percent effort people are going to respect that and they're going to want to get behind it and mm-hmm. you know what i mean like that that's how i am and that's how my team's always been we'll cheer for anybody you know what i mean if as long as they're trying as long as they're working hard and not making a fool of themselves you know not doing something stupid or messing the meat up or the, mm-hmm. order, the order of things you get up there and you try your best like i'm all that's that's why we're here yeah that's why everybody's here and that's that's something that's beautiful especially in this day and age where everybody is so separated and so broken apart into these little groups and subgroups and you go to a meet everybody there is on the same page you know if you need help from somebody you go look i, I really need this foam roller man i can't yeah. I, I forgot my. Does gonna, anybody have a? Does anybody have a set of bands? Can you, can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine the dude that says no? I can't mm-hmm. find my wraps. I had somebody that was like. That's I can't what I'm saying. It does. It, it, I mean, it's, it's it's so far and few that it. Really, I can almost say it doesn't happen. Yeah, it really yeah. does. You know, it's yeah. not going to happen. I mean, Mm-mm. you know, 
when everything was locked down, you know what sport kept going and people kept finding ways to compete were powerlifting meets. Mm -hmm. Now, you didn't know about half of them because they weren't posting shit. Yeah, but, but they were there. going. The people were there. Everybody so They were going, there. and there were a lot of fucking people there, yeah. you know, in a lot yeah. of different places. So it's the camaraderie, yeah. which is a big-ass thing. So let's move to the intermediate lifter now. So you're not dealing mm. with the advanced lifter, but now mm. say they got 10, 15 meets under their belt. Mm. You know, what are, what are some of the things that they need to... I mean, they're starting to figure it out, right? Yeah. So there's there's just some things that they might be screwing up. What do you see messed up I think, with them? I think 10 meets in is where things shift less away from technical aspects of how things go, more into psychological, where you start to get into your own head at that point. Oh, is this going to be like the last meet? Am I going to get the same thing I got last time? Is this going to, whatever, is this stuff going to work out? Is this thing that's going on with my shoulder wrong? And just sort of redirect and focus. I think from a standpoint of a coach at that point, my job is typically to redirect what they're focused mm -hmm. on. But in terms of general advice that I would give somebody, remember why you're there, right? Like, what are you there for? You're there to hit three lifts. Mm -hmm. right? You know what those lifts are. So you were talking about visualization. I think the intermediate level is kind of a, that's a period where you start to be able to visualize how a lift should look. When I'm visualizing a lift personally, right, and this is something that I always share with my clients, I don't ever think about the weight on the bar. When I think about myself being successful of a mm -hmm. lift, I think about the bar moving, how it's going to look, how I'm going to look, how my body's going to look. I don't think about how much weight's on there, you know? And, and so that's, I take the weight out of the equation. And in fact, some clients, as they're intermediates, they begin to get in their head with numbers. And then I just keep numbers from them. Like Sin mm -hmm. has no idea what she's going to lift yeah. because I know then it'll be an, a discussion. And like with Ellen, Ellen, because, you know, she's in it enough that she's interested and clever enough that she figures out she knows what these next attempts are. Like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, mm -hmm. listen, just sit down. That's the, that's the benefit of having a coach. I'm like, yeah, just yeah, sit yeah. there and just do what I'm telling you to do. So the, it's very difficult to give general advice as you get into the intermediate and advanced level because then people's diff you have individual differences that are really... Mm -hmm. It's a hold, lot of mitigation hold, from you. Holding yeah. people back. You know, I think yeah. the thing, the biggest thing that's holding somebody back is going to be different from person to person once they get past that beginning stage. It's usually something psychological, but you have to get to know the person. So, like, Ellen, for example, was just a, a worrier. She's like, oh, I don't know. Well, well, you know, so do that. I'm like, listen, just, so you have to have, you know, you have to sort of self-regulate psychologically. Yeah. If you're going to do this on your own and not have a coach, you got to be able to get your head right. Yeah, You know what I mean? You got to be able to keep your head right throughout the meet. For some people, that's distraction. I see people that, like, just sit there and literally they're, like, reading a book or reading something on their phone and it's time to, time to warm up. Okay, now it's go time. And that's mm -hmm. how I am, too. I prefer to, like, in between, I don't stress about it. And then when it's time to warm up, I'm on 100%. You know what I mean? So learning how to turn on and off, those are things. More of the, the psychological obstacles, I think, are the bigger things that people run into because it's not a matter of you know how to do the lift. If you've reached the intermediate stage, if you've done 10 meets, mm -hmm you know what's going to happen at that point. You've had whole mm -hmm. days of your life dedicated to this and months or years of your life preparing for this. So each one of those performances was important. You know, those are the sort of things that stick with you. You remember, oh, I met that, that other time I had to take my second attempt twice because I missed it like an idiot. On that second attempt at that, that subsequent meet, you're going to be ready for that second attempt. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not yeah. missing it this time because yeah. I want to have a shot at, you know, at beating this PR and what have you. So, yeah, I mean, those things shift, but it's hard to, I think, it, I think as you get into further away from beginner, the advice becomes less generalized and more specific to the individual. Yes, you know I would definitely I mean? say that. I'm saying that intermediate range and 10 meets is kind of not a good way to go up because they could be very strong at 10 meets or they could be, yeah. could be still, 10 years. still intermediate. So I'm saying yeah. intermediate as far as where their ranking is, mm. you know, so they're, they're right in the middle of whatever open power lifting's rank is. So they're not at the bottom anymore. They're right about in the middle. That's mm. where they're falling. So the advice I would give them is you're not that good yet, right? <laughs> so don't worry about cutting weight. Don't worry about dropping weight classes. Don't worry. You're not breaking all-time world records. You're not breaking world records. You know, just put together a really good total so you can move up into that next top 25 percent a I, better total yeah, yeah i think yeah, yeah yeah i think anybody can pretty much get to the top 25 30 percent yeah mm. you know so focus there first before doing what because you get to that mm. top level now you're dealing with weight cuts you're dealing with yeah. you know a lot of other things to where kind of just unnecessary mm. when you haven't really mastered the process even though it's a process that's never mastered 
it's self sabotage, I think, like uh, fundamentally, right, in a lot of ways. Because uh, you you do this to me all the time. We were getting like from like point A to point B, right, kind of trying to get to point C. And you, <laughs> I remember one day you just kind of looked at me and you were like, "Don't do dumb shit." That's it. That was really it. It's yeah. Like, don't do dumb don't shit. Don't do dumb like, shit. Stop Actually, being distracted by stupid things. I wrote a whole article. I think it was called "Don't Do Dumb Shit." <laughs> Yeah, about that exact thing. <laughs> yeah, well, the intermediate, I think, also needs to really work on um, being able to fly solo during times of the meet when they otherwise wouldn't expect it. Yeah. You know, say, mm -hmm. say your coach can't make it for some reason. You still have a meet. Yeah. Let's say he's got diarrhea. He can't be there for the bench. You still got to fucking do the meet. Right. You know, right. so you got to work on what, what's, what's your plan when the plan fails. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Because these are things that when you become the advanced lifter become more prominent. You know, be, because it's, you know, yeah. everything changes. All of these things help. I mean, it helps with all these issues to run a methodology because you have that whole, what if this happens? Right. Yes. If, the decision if, if this, then this. Then. Yes. So if the controllables is what I'm talking about. Yeah. The intermediate, you should yeah. at that point really be, the beginner, you're learning the process. The intermediate, mm. you're learning how to control all your controllables. Right. Now you're reining it in. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. once you get, let's, when you get to the advanced, you know, now you're, you're going to break, you know, you're either going to qualify for a world, you know, the mm -hmm. world's, I mean, the total matters, putting together really good lifts matter, or it's a world record that you could be true, you know, mm. now things are a, a different level, yeah. right? Now things are, you know, your controllables, you should have all under control, except your brain, you know, you got to keep your brain where it needs to be. There's people that don't even have those modified bells under control and they're in that top 30% already. Yes. Like a lot of them. And they're easy to mind fuck. Right. You know, well, if you got, so, if you got mean, somebody yeah. competing against them, they're easy to mind fuck. Oh, yeah, super. Yeah, you know, I mean, so that's from a mental standpoint. Yeah, and not that you want anybody to have a bad day, but you want to win. You know, still want to win. It's competitive. I mean, right. that that's where I think the sport becomes super competitive. At right. the end of the day, you can shake hands with someone who beat you. Yeah. Right. Well, the other thing you know I would I mean? say with that top lifter is the meets have to be competitive. Right. Mm. At that point, you're not cherry picking shit anymore. You're actually looking to go compete against people that are going to beat you. Actually competing instead yes. of just trying to do a, a PR total. Well, yeah, I mean, because the only way they're going to get better is to compete against people who are better. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Mo it's a good motivator, isn't it? Yeah, so, <laughs> it, well, yeah, things, you know, things change. Now travel comes in. You may be traveling to a different country. You may travel all the way to, you know, from Ohio to California, or these all become other variables where if you haven't mm -hmm. controlled the variables, in the intermediate level, yeah. yeah, good luck trying to deal with cutting weight, traveling six hours, you know, changing flights. Uh, somebody like Brandon Allen, you go to another continent, go to Australia and kick yes. everybody's ass. Exactly. <laughs> and walk out the spot. Yeah, and he doesn't do that's, that unless he's already learned how to control all those yeah, other controllables. That's what I mean. Like, that's, sort, that's another level. When you have yes. to go someplace where you're unfamiliar, now there's more to it. There's more, like you say, controllables or I call them modifiable variables. And in yeah. a lot of cases, the they're going by that, themselves. Yeah. 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 So most times we can bring a, a team with you to Australia. No. Yeah, they're going to have to find yeah. a handler when they're there. Yeah. yeah. And then teach the handler on what they need to do. And yeah. find a Chinese food place to get white rice and other things. <laughs> oh, yeah. All that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You yes. have to. Yeah. You got to literally find locations for everything because now it's not your local deal or it's not a meat that you've already done you I know? think at that point like what I've seen and what I'm super impressed with is the level of project management so to speak that just kind of goes into it mm. the amount of detail and the amount of thinking that kind of goes into like how much how much time you need to get over the jet lag for example a, yeah. a coach what is, is good to have do? for those situations yeah. Yeah. what Something is this like going to do to like your body weight are you going to yeah. react weird when you're on that level, like it's really good to have somebody to bounce stuff off of. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you need someone with a lot of experience in the trenches in terms of doing competitions and coaching a comp. Look, this is what we got to worry about. Well, what I what That's I it. see happen more frequently than it should is, and it is because of social media. So there's good and there's mm. bad, right? So mm. you can follow somebody's story as they're peaking for a meet that is in that situation. Well, then the beginner thinks that that's what they need to do. Yeah. getting ready for their local first meet. I need to yeah. cut weight. I need to drop a weight class. I need to do this. I need to do this. Yeah. And that's where that skill acquisition process is being, they don't know. Because you lose all contacts, right? Yes. All you see is what yeah. you see. It's a highlight reel of somebody, but it's like, you don't. Well, a big thing in life is know where you are. Right. And then where you want to go. Because it's, it's that you need to, you, need, you, you can't act like where you want to go. Like act as if I think is just a bullshit thing. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. I don't like that. You know, Pretend so you got to know where you are. You got to know where you are. Right. 
right and then maximize that process and then that's all part of that journey kind of moving forward yeah what are with um say ellen some of the other ones what are some of the other things that you've seen that you've had to rein her back in on or just advance things actually, that happen there can you hold that thought yeah i actually have to take a leak really yeah quick. yeah that works second. that works <laughs> <laughs> yes yes Be better than I don't yes so i'll circle back into the um when you were looking because i assume that you probably went through different coaches uh, yeah, I went through a couple. I was looking for somebody at some point. I tried to go solo by myself. I'm one of those weird people where I'm like, I need to try the thing to know what I'm getting myself into. I'm one of those weird ones. Mm -hmm. So, so when you were when you were, say I don't know how many. So you went through two or three different coaches, right? Yep. And then you're with Swede. So, what looking back, where did those coaches? fail you know i think it was or I, or you i, I mean it's just it mutually was, i think it was a mutual thing right like i think that at that point in my life i was a much different person the way that i, I wasn't really great at communicating like what i personally needed so it was like i would just follow this plan even though somewhere inside like i knew that maybe this wasn't really what i wanted to do but i just figured like i don't know better and this person knows better right fundamentally it landed me with like this very unpleasant shoulder problem right over a longer timeline so you know those are those are some of the things that i think about you know when we think about failure it's like how do we define it right like again for me it goes back to i wish i had taken the time to be specific with myself and be realistic with myself with what are the goals what do i want to accomplish and why am I doing that? Because in truthfulness, I don't think I was really ready to, at that point, to like really even have a coach. Like, mm -hmm. I really don't. I don't, it just so happened that it worked out that way, right? But was I ready to be coached by somebody? No, I was almost too coachable because I was just following along, but not asking the right questions to understand why, right? So with, if you never really take the time to understand why these things are happening, in some logical way, you're gonna stay in the kind of that beginner phase, right? To your point about yes. like, if you don't ask the questions, you're always gonna be stuck in that beginner phase. And so I was stuck in that beginner phase where I was basically getting hammered, right? You just didn't know. I just didn't know any better, yeah. right? I was one of those weird people that just somehow wound up on a platform doing halfway decently, <laughs> but like, yeah, you've always been coachable, but I, I know I, I know what you're saying about yeah. being too coachable. Too that could definitely be to your detriment too. Like you should ask why, right? Like I yeah. want, I want clients to ask me why. Like if I tell you to do something, like what's this for? Why do I need to do that? Yeah. Anyone that, anyone that's in like an education position, and you ask them why they should do, why you should do what they're saying, and they don't have a good answer for you, like run away from that person. Hey, hey, exactly, right. and because even yeah. if they're just experimenting, they can say, "Look, I don't fucking know. I think this might work." Yeah, that's yeah. an acceptable answer. Totally it's an honest great. answer. I'm trying totally something great. different. Yeah, yes, yeah. like yeah. nothing. I can't see any other way right now. Right. Mm. But this is what I got. Yeah. You know, let's give it a shot. Um, and if it's totally black, they're gonna say, you know, just let's let's give me a pause on this question. Yeah. You know, mm. let me go ask people that I go to when I'm stuck. Yeah. And then come back. You know, yeah. and be able to see, but they really, it shouldn't, they shouldn't be having you do anything from the beginning. Right. That they shouldn't be able to answer why yeah. see, to start. The, the other thing yeah. that I would say that's <laughs> like the biggest red flag that I've ever seen is when I ask somebody why, and they tell me why, but they say it in a way that there's no human on earth that would ever understand those words. That's because they don't yeah. understand. You know what it. I mean? And then you ask they the question. They muddy the water. They <laughs> muddy the water to make it seem yeah. deep. <laughs> That's it, man. That's the truth. And you're like, red flag, red flag, do yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> if, they really, if they really know what they're doing, they could explain it to a four-year-old. Right. That's the thing. The, the, more, the more comfortable you are with any set of information, right? the more simple you're gonna be able to describe yeah. it. Right. So the more yes. you know about it, the easier it is to describe it. It shouldn't be harder. And that's why when I'm using these these terminologies and technical terms, there's always a reason I'm using them. So I try to explain that, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? I'm not just saying microcycle because I don't want to say weak. Mm -hmm. I'm not just saying MSM because I don't yeah. want to say secondary movement. These words are specific meanings. things. Yeah, the words have meanings, right? Yes. Yeah, so there should be a reason. Now, the, now, on the coach's side, the education level should be high enough, too, that if they're challenged by somebody sure. who really knows their shit, 
they should be able to say, well, this is why, and then explain it in such a way that that person is going to understand too. Yeah. Not saying they need to do it at a PhD level, right. but right. even right. if a PhD was the challenge and they know exercise science, strength and conditioning and all this inside now, right. the terminology might be a little off, something might be a little off, but they should be able to at least listen to what you're saying and say, mm -hmm. follow where you're going. Right. Mm -hmm. If it's just a clusterfuck, then the person needs to go back and, and spend more time. There's yeah. no train of logic. Know. Yes, mm -hmm. on, on learning, you yeah. know, the what they're doing. With the, because you just launched a book with Greg, I believe, on the bench press, right? Oh, that's actually, a, it's a program. So, so it's, it's a, a bench, program. Yeah, it's a bench program. That's so a to, example. to dial back on the bench press, when you were doing the seminars, what were like the two biggest things you saw? Now, granted, it was, it was weird. Well, it's, let me backtrack that question because when I was doing seminars, it was really weird because it would vary by region. Mm. You know, like some states did these things wrong, where other states is like there was somebody in each state going around showing people fucked up shit. Yeah, where it's, they all... it's definitely a locality to it. There's yeah, no so doubt there about is. That. So, it's, so you let's guys all do this. Shit, so huh? let's let's yeah. So what? <laughs> let's let's dial it back a little bit more and just say what's yeah. what's the what's the one thing that wherever you went, it was like, damn it, this is always. Like, you know you need to teach it before you even get there. On the bench press? Yeah. Set up. Yes. Set up. Okay. Because, you know, there's so many different versions of how people are setting up. And and I, most of them, if you ask somebody, if you ask the average person that does some complicated shit on the bench when they're getting set up, they do all these different. Like, why are you doing that? What does that do for you? Oh, I just like it. I feel locked in that way. It's like, yeah, but that's actually working against you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's so many things that can be wrong. It's hard to, to narrow it down to what's the most common. I would say on all the lifts, the most common thing is that people do not keep their glutes tight. Right? That's just number one. And, like, so part of bracing, like, you can brace your, your abdomen when you're benching, which is a, obviously you should do that. That's how you get transferred to and from the floor. But if your glutes are loose, then your pelvis is just going to wobble around. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Every, so you're going to lose most of that transfer. So the same thing goes for unracking, having, you know, unracking on a uh, squat. Like, they may be bracing upstairs, but then their glutes are as loose as can be. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. So that's something that's very common that I would just, as a anecdotally, just as a generalization, that's something that I see as very common. But generally, people don't have any plan as to how they set up for each lift. Mm -hmm. So it looks different every time. And that's just a recipe for chaos. Mm -hmm. and it's like a recipe for injuries. <laughs> well, like, yeah, I mean, if they can't, as you said, transfer the force, you yeah, know, then, then, then the force is going to transfer them. Yeah, it, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's going to go one way or the other. So, yeah, uh, yeah if they can't consistently perform the same rep. If you can't perform the exact same rep consistently, you're not really training. You're just doing all kind of random stuff. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like getting all, you're no, there's guys like that, young kids that happen to be pretty strong, you know, that, oh, I can bench 300 pounds, but, like, only sometimes. It's, it, what, what you, you figure out if you watch them for a while, the reason they can do it, some, sometimes they have a decent bar path and it just happens to be that it touches where it should and so mm -hmm. they're able to press it up. Otherwise, they have no idea. They're just bringing it out of the rack yeah. all crazy. And, you know, it might be a pretty strong kid, but without that technique, there's no real chance for improvement. So you have to kind of iron out for each lift, what is it that's important here? What are the things that I need to be looking at? And a lot of it, is, mainly it's positioning. Okay, I think speed is the last thing on the list, but speed is definitely on the list. It's important. Uh, bar path is is right up there with positioning so getting mm -hmm. into a good position and bracing correctly right so in other words controlling that force if you're not controlling that force it controls you it's like you just said that's a that's a good way to put it it's gonna it's gonna go somewhere you're just not gonna be able to direct where it's going yeah you know what I mean? so yeah. when you have weight in your hands or on your back that's a problem i mean it's a problem either way even when you're deadlifting but i think you're you're less likely to drop the bar on yourself deadlifting so how would you how would you suggest changing the bracing if somebody's got their feet out in front compared to their feet tucked? Because in one way the abdominal wall is stretched, and the other way it's not. Right. So I think that regardless, the abdominal wall should not be stretched too much because I don't think that for and everything I say. Let me preface this by saying every piece of advice that I give you is referred is, is regarding raw lifting. Mm -hmm. right? So like on a raw bench press, a big mistake that I see is that people are in anterior pelvic tilt to the extremity, to the end, to, to the end range of motion. Like they're doing just what you're saying, like they're stretching the abdominal, mm -hmm. in front of the abdominal wall as much as possible so it's weak. And it's not in a good position to transfer the force from the floor either because of the angle of the pelvis. So it seems like that's making you tighter, pushing those legs back further and so forth. But regardless of whether your feet are forward or tucked real far behind you, 
that's what the reason I teach the bench press the way I do where I have people scoop back and then slide forward is when they scoop back it gives them an the opportunity to brace first and keep the glutes tight as they slide forward so then you don't lose that tightness in the abdominal wall right and that allows for better transfer uh, and that leads to another thing that's a huge issue where people think that if you have a bunch of lumbar extension, it's gonna help you in a raw bench press, and it's not. It's gonna hurt you, it's gonna cost you transfer, absolutely. It's more than likely gonna to lead to SI joint issues, sprains and, and so forth in the SI joint because of the fact that you're at the end range of motion. So uh, force load changes at the SI joint when you're in anterior pelvic tilt, right? So it's distributed differently, right? And uh, if I had a picture, if I was doing a seminar, I would. This is where I will pull a picture mm -hmm. out and give you an, an idea mm -hmm. of what's happening there. So I do think one of the things that's crucial is that, that you, you want to get as close to neutral as you can with the pelvis, whether or not you're tensioning the front of the quad. So whether or not you're actually tucking those feet. I have the feet set before I have people slide forward so that way they're already bracing, they don't lose that. And then most of the arch that you see on a raw bench press should be thoracic extension. And that's going to come from burying those traps at the top by the neck, right? and then driving back. So whether your feet are forward or tucked, the imperative is the same. You're driving the bar back, to, you're driving back towards the bar, back towards the rack the whole time. And then as, because you have that whole system tensed, you stay driven back, as the bar descends, all that kinetic energy is gonna pass through your super tight arm that's gonna transfer that force, which is your whole body, down to the floor, and then on the reversal, it's gonna fire right back and hopefully, you're still going to be neutral in terms of the pelvis and you're going to have enough thoracic extension and be high enough on your traps and stay driven back. All that stuff's going to transfer right back into the bar and you're going to be able to lock out the bench like that. You know, so most of everything that I see that's wrong with the lift has to do with the way people are initiating or setting up the lift. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, there's a lot of maybe miscommunication or misunderstanding in terms of the idea of how leg drive works too. That's another thing that, People think of it as this thing that's just going to kick in and like suddenly lift the weight for you. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be able to just drive their legs in the floor as hard as they can at some point, and that's going to get the lift. And this is not really how it works. It <laughs> <laughs> doesn't work that way. It's not your legs. Your legs aren't lifting it. You know, the legs are actually, they're working sort of like a springboard and that they're storing, they're helping you store that elastic potential energy. And that's in everything, like the tendons, ligaments, all the stuff in your lower body. And then, as you go into the floor, it's gonna hold that as elastic potential energy and it gets released again as, as kinetic energy as you begin to press. And it takes time for that to dissipate. So like if there's a three second wait or pause on the press command, it's gonna be gone. And that's why you can't make a lift after a long mm -hmm. press command and you can make it easily if there's less. And the reason for that is that kinetic energy is slowly dissipating. You know, it's kinda, it, it leaves. Um, yeah, so you get the idea. So those, yeah. are, those are the biggest issues with bench press I see is that people aren't getting themselves into a position where, first of all, mechanically, they can perform the movement correctly. So if you're flat on the bench and your scaps are pinned between the weight on the bar, right, and the pad, so they can't move correctly the way they need to in order for you to press, that's an issue. So you're fighting against that. You're fighting against that aspect of it, the whole lift anyway. That's a huge thing. You can't get transferred that way because you're not driven, you're not set up correctly. All these things, and I found that like, I don't know what you think about this. I'm actually, this is what the whole idea was with the 4-4 system that I use for grading is that I take a lift and I start with an ideal. Like, how do I want this lift to look when I'm done teaching it? How do I want the person to be able to do it? And I think, okay, well, what are the constituent elements of that? of that system, of that mechanical system of that lift. And I break it down into cues that are easier to understand. Sort of like the reaching cue we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Staying driven on the traps, like drive, drive, staying driven, right? Um, things like that. Things that are just easy to understand elements of the lift. And when a lift begins to, so as long as you encompass within those, everything that's important about the technique of the lift, so path is considered, what is it about? What cue is making that path correct? Mm -hmm. Is it reaching? Is that helping? You know, things like that. So then if the path comes out, it comes out, it gets out of whack. Are you reaching before that rep? You know, you're doing that, you're reinforcing mm -hmm. that. So we have things to correct it. You know what I mean? So if you assemble a lift based on cues, as it begins to degrade, which all lifts are going to degrade, 
every single lift you're good at, things are going to go wrong, and they're eventually going to be going. They're going to start. It's entropy, man. This is mm-hmm. the way it works. Yeah. Things start to to go bad, and your entire career, even once you're technically proficient or really good at doing the lifts, your entire career is going to be about mitigating that loss and and repairing it as it goes. So in other words, you're doing things to prevent breakdown, and then when breakdown does occur, you're correcting it. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's it. That's the training year is a yeah. bunch of that. And then at the end of the day, hopefully you look back and you're like, ah, now I'm stronger. Yeah. And I maintain the same technique because if you get 10 more pounds on the bar and now it looks like shit, you didn't help yourself out at all. You're actually you're head, you're closer to the end, but not in a good way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You're, you're going to get yeah. worse and worse. So that's not a win. I don't even consider that a win. If you put five more pounds or 10 more pounds on the bar and it looks like shit compared to where it looks good before, it's like it's got some work to do before that's really a PR. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, because there's the potential is much higher. Right, exactly. You know, with, with, with that. And that's where some people get lost in the, yeah. you know, like they see the five pounds or the 10 pounds, and then it's like, well. You know. And I get it. It's yeah. a carrot. I mean, and that's yeah, what we're here yeah, for, yeah, right? Yeah. But. I mean, we can teach you how to bounce the fucking thing if that's all you're looking for. But, <laughs> right. You know, that's right. not going to be good. Mm. <laughs> it's not good at all. Which right. the, um, speaking of bouncing it, when we put that video out a couple of years ago of you know breaking your back on the bench and you when you blew your, you know that thing's got I mean it blew up right it's like a so million views it's like a, yeah it's it's ridiculous how many views it got but because of that the, a lot of the questions that were coming in was how did you rehab after that you mm. know how did you what did you do for your back after that man well that was a that was a process that was an ordeal I'll tell you the biggest the biggest issue was. Not like the thing happening, not being embarrassed or anything like that, because I was able to stand up and, uh, you know, I knew I was messed up, but I was able to stand up and smile and Mm -hmm. everybody was happy, you know, Mm -hmm. and I actually pulled after that, which is insane, Mm -hmm. but I I was in my head, I'm thinking I'm on to the next meet, like we talked about, I was like, I'm going to, you know, I got to qualify for this other meet that I, you know, that's Mm going to be down the road, but at least if I have the qualifying total in there, I'll be good. So I just randomly figured out what would it be for that total, pulled that, and then that was the end. And uh, it didn't really sink in. I mean, I knew I was wrecked. I knew I was, I knew something was wrong. I had numbness in my foot and numbness in the back of my leg. And I was like, man, this will this will wear off or something. You know, I'll mm-hmm. be good. I'm going to take a week off or something. I'm going to back mm-hmm. off for a little bit, and then it'll be, it'll be all right. It's not all right. Uh, I was a, subsequently to that I was handing out to a client that had like 65 pounds on the bar or something and I literally almost like fell over trying to hand it out and I handed it out I was like oh and like and thank god she was able to get it back into the rack at the end of the set because I couldn't have helped her I was literally I was like oh, mm-hmm. we're gonna have to reschedule this <laughs> you know mm-hmm. like and then I realized and uh yeah that was it I couldn't stand anymore I fell down and uh it was horrific. The whole thing was horrific, man. It was just such an experience. They had the ambulance came and took me. And yeah, that was bad. But that wasn't that wasn't the the biggest thing. The thing that was the biggest thing for me was like I said before, like we were talking about in the beginning of this podcast. I do have that need. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I do. I have established a need for training. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, what do I do now? You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm like, what do I do now? So I'm like, well, the first thing is I'm going to have to... Clearly, I, I got the MRI and slipped on the hospital. They said it was broken and that there was all sorts of stuff wrong. I need to have two pieces taken out and, and a piece of a disc and a root nerve thing that had to be relocated, so I had to be a neurosurgeon. So I interviewed a couple neurosurgeons. And the uh, guy that did it, I want to say his name is Bonarotti. He was the, he was the man. As soon as, I interv- as soon as I started talking to him, I was like, this is the guy. Mm-hmm. You know, because I started, I, he's, he was realistic with me, and he's like, look, I'm going to be honest with you. At the end of it, he's like, look, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think you're going to be able to do the stuff that you used to do. And I'm like, let me worry about that. I can't, I'm like, I can't do the surgery. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to do that. The other stuff, I know how to do that. Yeah, yeah. You know? So I just sort of I was like faking this confidence, but I can remember having that period where I'm like, well, what do I do here? What do I do? Because do I just accept that this is not something I'm able to have as part of my life anymore? Mm-hmm. You know, that, that aspect of it? Or, and I said, no, nah, I realized I, I played with that idea for a little bit. I realized I couldn't accept it. So I had to come up with a, a plan. Because I've been, 
I've been in low places in my life. I've been in places in my life that most human beings will never go. You know, like I've been in isolation. I've been in the hole. I've been in hopeless places. But in any of those situations, the thing that that's done for me and it's helped me, I'm not saying that that was like something that like, oh, I wish that never happened or, no, like I learned from every single, every, every experience that caused me to suffer more than normal taught me something, you know? Mm -hmm. That's why I'm still moving. And I always would make a plan. Like I can remember making a plan like when I was in prison. <laughs> and, so, and so I started to do that again when I was still in the hospital because they couldn't do the surgery right away. I ended up, he had like been up all night doing an emergency surgery on a car accident or something. So I had some time and time can be good or time can be torture, you know? So I was like, I'm gonna use this. So I made a plan. So I made a plan and I decided I will be able to do all the lifts again. I will be able to do them as heavy as I can. You know, I'm not gonna be limited by this, but I gotta be realistic about the time frame. Mm -hmm. So what's a good amount of time? I'm like telling myself, is a year a good amount of time? That's too long. I can't wait a year. I'm like, well, what if I can do like some of the lifts? So I negotiated back and forth with myself. Like, well, I'll be able to bench sooner than anything else. So I was like, all right, how about this? I'll agree to three years, but I want to compete in bench right away. Show myself that I can do it. I can get right back. Because otherwise you have, there's a lot of things like when it's like it becomes a dragon, it becomes a dragon, it becomes, and it gets more and more powerful the more you're afraid of it. Oh, well, I, I can't bench over 500 pounds anymore. Can't get under that weight. That might kill me. It almost killed me. So I had to do it again right away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, well, I got to see that right away. So I set the stage for that and I ended up doing bench only at Rome. It was like nine months or so after that surgery. So I did do that. But that was the, that was like the trade I gave myself, letting myself do that, which was stupid. It was probably a dumb move to try to compete that soon after something that serious. But I was like, okay, and it was, it was difficult. There was some back and forth with getting, you know, being able to deal with leg drive and bracing correctly and kind of had to do a ton of other things that I wasn't used to doing just to be able to perform, that made me better. That made me understand what to do better. It made me a better coach. But eventually it was, I think at the end of the day, the, the thing that made the difference was patience. I made a, a solid plan. And then when things started going my way, I didn't change the fucking plan. That's what people do. Mm -hmm. They make a plan. They might make a good plan. I'm gonna wait 18 months to recover from this surgery. I'm gonna be working the whole time towards it. And then things go good after six weeks, they max out and you know, destroy it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, rip out the implant or do something wrong. You know what I mean? And uh, so I was like, all right, I'm not going to do that, but I am going to beat on myself and I'm going to use my recoverability, whatever capacity I have to adapt, I'm going to use it to strengthen this area. So I just did everything I could for maybe the first 18 months to two years. I was doing rack pulls, crazy amounts of rack pulls. Reverse hyper was a huge thing that helped me a lot. Um, I did, I put together, um, so I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the idea of the McGill Big Three. Mm -hmm. So I just started doing a ton of research. I didn't have any idea what that was. So I started doing research and, you know, I tried what those three things were and I realized I had to modify them a little bit. And as I started to modify them, I, I was thinking, well, what am I trying to accomplish with this? And those were the modifications I made. So I've written some articles on Elite about that, mm -hmm. like modif you know, like modified bird dogs, modified side bridges, ab wheel rollout, all that stuff was that was always part of fist set and the warm ups, like the from the first book, you got that in there, mm -hmm. how to warm up, you know. But I started to take that stuff to, uh, I started to treat it with religious zeal. I never did anything without doing those things, without like sort of mobilizing, doing the cat camels or cat cows, or whatever, whatever terminologies you want to use to reduce spinal friction. I started doing that every time before I got into the bar, I started trying to do glute stuff to activate, you know, and activation stuff's a highly contentious subject, but I can tell you this, like, there's a proprioceptive effect to having blood in a, in a muscle. That's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. It makes a big difference. So doing that for me was night and day. That ended up helping me, right? So I, I, I incorporated those things. I included them. I still do them to this day. Bottom line, most succinct way to explain it, I made a long view plan and I stuck with it. 
And that was very hard not to make a plan. It's easy to make a plan. Sticking with it over an extended time frame is very hard, especially when you're somebody with my type of psychology that I want to, I want to push it. So I found ways that I could push it. And that was what I did. I came up with a strategy that allowed me to push it in ways that weren't going to screw me up. Mm -hmm. And I got, and I got through that and, uh, got to the point where, you know, squatting really heavy, pulling really heavy. And everything was back to normal, and that took me right around three years. You, you yeah. said during this story that, you know, training's taking you through or helps you, you know, cope with, get through, work through dark mm. times, mm. you know. So when was the, when did you first realize that was what you needed to work through that? I'm, I'm, it, was it in prison or was it before going? In my life? Yes, in your life. Yeah, before prison. I had it when I went into prison. I was already a national level bodybuilder at that point. Yeah, so what, what sparked it? I um, started training super young. I had, I had some experience with weights. Like I was lifting free weights from when I was like 12 years old. Just because I had that weight set. So once I had it, I was like, oh, I'm going to do this. I did it every day. Bench press, shoulder press. It was always, it was kind of a part of my deal, my routine. As I started to do it with other people, I realized I was better than those people at it. So I was like, oh, this is something I'm actually good at, and it's something that I know how to do. You know, and there weren't, there weren't many things on that list at that point, like is the case for most people in their, their early teen years. Yeah. So it became a staple, it became part of my character. The fact that I was willing to do that consistently when other people weren't. So it became somewhat of like a point of pride for me that I did that, you know. Or that significance was, being, basically being seen. No, 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 just it was something that I didn't care if other people knew. Yeah. But the fact that I knew that I did this thing that most people don't do. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then I did it like I took it seriously. It was something about me. It was a characteristic. Mm -hmm. It was maybe not unique, but it was something that was different. And it wasn't that I really cared about other people knowing about it. You know what I mean? No, I get what you're but saying. I didn't have any comparison. But you cared about knowing about it. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, I'll give you an example. I used to bench, and I would always be benching and squatting with this kid that lived on my street. And I had that little, I had this little shitty, like, like a Hulk Hogan bench. And I remember he trained with me pretty regularly, and I was stronger than him, which I expected, because I was bigger than him. But he had a brother that was bigger than both of us. And uh, he was walking down the street one day, and we're like, yo, why don't you come over and lift weights with us? And he came, and, and he laid down and was, like, trying to bench press. It was only, like, 150 pounds, but he couldn't do it. Like, he, he put it on what we were doing, and he, like, touched it down to his chest and, like, messed up, and we had to, like, pull it off of him, and I'm like, that was the first time I ever realized, I'm like, man, this is something I can do that everybody can't do. Yeah. And this is a guy that I expect to be way bigger and stronger than me, and he, he can't do it. So it kind of, it, it became, at that point, it became something that was like sort of cool, right? So, and well, it's a sense of accomplishment. Yeah. Self-confidence, you know, yeah, self-confidence, yeah. I suppose. It was the first thing I was good at, maybe. Yeah. Right? And then... uh it's not to say that I was like the best at it by any means. I wasn't, but it was something that I was pretty good at. And at that age, there's not many things that you're pretty good at, you know? And uh, so it was, it kind of backdoored its way in for me. So because I did that, because of that, I was doing it fairly consistently at a young age for an extended period of time. And, uh, you know, I had a very rough upbringing. Well, you said earlier that yeah, there, you know, with, without training, the training saved your life. That's it. That's what, so, so, that, so that, let me get to that part. That was the tie. That was the thread that, that was woven through my, the fabric of my entire story. That's the only thing that was always there, you know? So the way it got in, the first pass with the needle was that it was something that I tried and I was pretty good at. I wanted to be like the people that could do it. I felt accomplished because even other people that were even a little older than me, I would expect to be stronger, weren't, you know? So that kind of, that got the hook in me. And then as that needle keeps winding through my whole story, uh, I, I learn things, I make mistakes, I end up in prison, and uh, I still have that thread. I still got that thing to hold on to. And that's what, that's, that's, that's how I got through. That's the thing that got me through. You know, there's no question about it. That that was the that was the reason that I was able to make it through that whole experience was that I had that to not only to look forward to, to challenge myself with, to sharpen myself with, to try myself with. It like built my confidence. You know, the fact that I could actually help other people do well with it. 
you know, I, I knew I could. I was already working. I started working as a personal trainer when I was like 18. But there was, it's been, it's inextricably linked to me in every way. It's been a part of my life, like from the beginning there, and then through all the dark parts. See, that's the thing that I, I try to impart in other people about this is that you don't realize how important this is to you until everything else gets messed up. You know, like kind of what we were talking about with the lockdowns. I, you know, the people like, here's how you know that that questionnaire that I was talking about works. It's because I didn't lose anybody. I lost one person because <laughs> every single one of those people that I was working with when the world shut down and every gym closed, every single one of those people needed it. So it was effective. So that strategy of trying to make sure it's something that people need was working. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it may be a journey to get to the point where you realize that you need it. But I think until you get there, it's very difficult to, to see things through. The idea of just doing it because I want to win a contest or I want to win a competition, I don't think that lasts. You, you yeah, well, if, if you didn't have that, where would you be? Me? Yes. I would be in prison still probably. I would be back in prison. Yeah. I can't even imagine where I'd be, dude. Honestly, I don't even want to think down that road. Somebody like me, you know, I'm a man of faith. I believe that was part of the plan. I think that God put those things in my path so that I would use them, even though I didn't understand at the time. There's a lot of times when things come into our path, we don't know what they mean. You know, when things cross our path. This is something that I picked up, and for whatever reason, we can talk all day about what maybe the reason was that I decided to keep lifting when I was young. For whatever reason, it was still there when the time came that I needed it. You know what I mean? So it's, uh, yeah, it's something that, it's linked to every aspect of my life. It's linked to my faith. It's linked to everything. You know, like when I'm, when I'm lifting, and this has been the case for a long time because I wasn't always vocal about my faith, but when I'm lifting, I'm praying the whole time. I pray before every set. I pray during sets. You know, it's like an experience. I look at it as something that is a spiritual journey for me, you know. And, uh, you know, I think we all get, get on or off course a little more throughout different periods in our life. But you have to ask yourself. And for me, when I look back at, you know, at this point in my life, when I look back, which it's been a lot of experience and it's been long, the one thing that I can say that was there throughout the entirety of it was that. I always had that. I always had a firm hold of that thread. You know what I mean? And uh, it carried me through. And there was times in my adult life, even after I got out of jail, when I was, you know, you would think doing better. Like I was doing, I was successful, like, you know, selling books, coaching people, making money and what have you. But like, you know, I was, you know, in, dis in a state of despair. I was despondent for most of my adult life. And that was the glue that held me together, you know? was the ability that I knew, like, I could always go back to that. I could always make a plan and, you know, I sort of would, I would look at it like, I lay out a plan for me that's gonna be challenging. And then I would look at it like, okay, well, I always feel, again, it's very difficult when you get into motivations, it's very difficult for me to explain motivations without touching on the topic of God. Because I feel like it's an experience with me and God. And that's it, and that's not to say like, it's a private thing that only I'm getting or what have you. It, it's, it's individual, you know, how that works. But for me, like everything, when I lay out a plan, it's like I make a deal with God. I'm going to do this part, and that's it. And we'll see what happens on your end. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. I know that God has the power to put things and make things happen for me or not, you know. So if I give 100% effort, my experience has been this. If I give 100% effort in something, he makes a way. So your, your, your desire in motivation or ability and wanting to help other people get into powerlifting is more than just the powerlifting it's more than the fifth set it's more than all this other stuff it's you yeah. want to introduce them to the same thing that's been there for you right for your whole entire life it's it's a it's a mechanism you know what i mean what are you going to use it for that's the thing is like i want i want people to be able to benefit from it the way that i have that's not to say that it's going to be because look, I mean, for a long time, I was definitely not living my life the right way. I was always lifting weights. I always believed in God. <laughs> but I believe that the weights brought me back to God. Like that was the thing that like, that was, it was always this dance back and forth between me. I need to be able to do this. This is something I need. And 
And it's I, something that you need, but why, why are you so passionate about helping other people find that same mechanism? Because, it, you know, what, what, what if you didn't find it? Is well, that why? Well, that's the thing. Here's the thing. Like, if I didn't, if I could speculate what would have happened, I can tell you it wouldn't be good. I'd probably be dead right now. I probably would have gone a different direction. I would have, you know, gone the way of drugs. Honestly, like I was already, uh, to some degree or other, like uh, self-medicating at that point. When I went to prison, I was making up for things I didn't have. And uh, I really, dude, I, honestly, I really believe that God used it. I mean, I think it's, that's, that's so, so if I can look at it and I can say, hey, I believe that God used this to bring me out of despair. You know, not saying that like powerlifting is going to make you holy or anything like that. And it could easily go the other way, you know. But as I look back, that's my experience, you know, is that this, this made me better. It never made me worse. You know, it's almost like I was able to instinctively know I'm, I'm supposed to help other people. I'm not Why supposed though? to be the star. You see what I'm saying? Why? Because I would, I would ruin myself when I tried to be the star. So like when I did bodybuilding, I wanted to be center stage. I wanted to be elevated, right? And uh, that was the worst version of myself. Or I would be like, oh, like that's things that people act like that makes them good, that they're willing to cut out things out of their life. But like, that's not good. Cutting family out of your life's not good. Cutting people out of your life that you love and care about that matter so that you can win some competition is stupid, right? So when I got to the point that I realized I'm cutting people out, I'm doing things that should be in my life are no longer priority because of this other stupid pursuit, right? That was when I realized like this, I'm not somebody who can balance that, right? But I, I do know a lot about it, and I have been passionate about it for a long time, and I can help other people with it. And then I, when I first started moving into that, it was actually with bodybuilding before powerlifting, with helping people with bodybuilding. I realized, like, this is better. This feels better, you know? Somewhere along the way, I realized that, like, and I even initially started, like, lying to myself about it. I'm like, I'm doing this because it makes me feel better to help other people. And when I see other people get out of it what I got out of it, it makes me feel better. So it's, I could still view it as a selfish pursuit almost, you know, and that mm -hmm. made it almost okay. But I realized, you know, in hindsight that that was, it was never a selfish thing. Of course it feels good to help people. Mm -hmm. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to help people. If I didn't have people that helped me, mm -hmm. I, you know, I can't say where I'd be. If I didn't have somebody that taught me about lifting weights, I can't say where I'd be, you know? Uh, I think that, yeah. I think that sums it up for me in terms of my motivation of why I want to help people. I mean, I, of course you want to help someone understand the thing that helped you understand life, right? Yeah. And for me, lifting was a big part of me understanding life and uh, understanding what my role is in it. My role is not to be a champion, you know? And some people, that's their role. You know, that's, that's what they're born for. My role is to help people, is to help people talk things through with themselves in their head. Is that the right next move? You know, things like that, questions. Kind of like you're asking me questions right yeah, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like that. I think they're motivating people through, and it's good because then if, well, some people will just give you canned answers. But if you can get people to actually consider what you're asking them, think about it, you can make a difference in somebody's life. You know? Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, that's that's what it is. I think that, of the people I've worked with, I don't know. I mean, it's very difficult to say what some, what other people would say about you, but I think that's the thing I would like to think that people said about me. Well, we can. Which I don't. Oh yeah, since since right here. <laughs> I don't know. Hey. I mean, hey. Yeah. I mean, it just it helped me. It's something that you don't want to lose, and that was actually an interesting story with Sin, and and that's directly related to that is that she was saying that she was done. I'm like, no, 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 no. You're not done. I really wanted to be done. Yeah, but, but you didn't. You thought that. But you didn't. You weren't actually done yet. And there's the thing that comes along with being, like, what are we talking about now? You need to do a meet, right? Yeah. Why do you need to do a meet? Because I'm floating. Because you're floundering. Because that's I'm what happens when you don't have a goal. I'm right? terrible at exercising. I right. don't like exercising. Right, right. I need to train. You need a goal. I need to train. I'm too goal-oriented. That's the, Everybody is. If you don't have something you're aiming at, you're just floundering. You got to be aiming for something. You got to be shooting at something. And it doesn't got to be the world championships, but you know, it's got to be like maybe a PR, mm -hmm. 
something. A PR at this body weight, a PR since I've been injured. Getting back to where you were. Yeah, getting back to where you were. Yeah, something like that. Maintaining where you were. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You can't, your goal can't be to just flounder and yeah, just it's like enjoy. A weird compulsion. Yeah. Yeah, it has to be pushing it. And like the thing is, like, you know, dude, you have like hip replacements and shit, right? You're still squatting heavy. You have to. So yeah. it becomes a point where that's no longer an option. Well, that's what I was saying earlier when we were talking about, you know, different people's motivation levels. And where I said earlier, my 20% is a lot more than what other people think their 100% is. Exactly. Because it's my, my, deep rooted your need is bigger need yeah is vastly bigger right right and you know it's we got to understand that in other people you know that their needs are going to be different levels mm. right so now how they're going to fill that it may be with training it may be with writing it may be with a multitude of different things mm -hmm. you know but you know i feel i mean that's why the aim of the company is live learn and pass on you know it's you know that's that's deep in me yeah you know that i just fuck up most of my life it's know? the only thing that's ever made me feel good that's it that's so if I, I could answer your question if you want to rewind it it's the only thing that's ever made me feel good is successfully helping somebody else that is a level of that's goodness like that's definitional goodness like where i feel valuable I feel like i'm i'm i have a purpose that's good it's so like winning a bodybuilding or, or powerlifting meet is not a purpose to me. It's not something that is ever going to make me feel like. Well, that's why you're going to be a great father. And it's ch everything changed, man. That's it. That's it. Like uh, seeing my daughter born, man, is like that's the first time that's ever happened outside of coaching or teaching. Yeah. That changed everything. That changed like the lens that I view everything through is different now. Uh, it's yeah. I feel like all of this has been preparation for that, maybe. And uh, that's a that's a beautiful thought, you know. But uh, yeah, there's definitely something to it. There's nothing. There's nothing like the feeling of responsibility. And. Yeah, there's this sense of responsibility that you have towards another living being that you created, that you that you made. That when, you know, like I, like I held her in my hands. I like literally was there. I caught her. You know, like I was there for first breath. And yeah, I think it all just prepared me for that. I felt ready. I mean, who says that? <laughs> but it's true. Nah, I, I mean, I, not many. <laughs> I felt I felt ready. I was ready. Everyone's like, oh man, you know. But yeah, I'm like, man, I'm ready. Yeah, I, I felt ready, and yeah. I and I am ready, and it's a, it's a blessing that this is beyond measure, man. I can't even explain to you how much my life has shifted in a positive way since then. Like we we're talking about before, like there's never been a period of time. Somebody asked me about this the other day. There's never been a period of time in my life that I didn't despair. That's just my default has always been despondence, just hopelessness. Not like not like necessarily like hopelessness where I'm like oh, like, you know, but just where I just accept. That that's the way that's going to be my baseline and uh albeit it's only been a few weeks you know a little over two weeks i have not despaired <laughs> never been a time because i always have that in my head like nah man no time for that <laughs> mm -hmm. you know i got somebody that needs me you know and uh, it's the same thing with having a wife like my wife getting married and these are things that like sheesh i wasn't i didn't know if i'd ever do these things and uh so that's a good example. I mean, maybe a dysfunctional example, but that's a good example of how something like powerlifting can make you a better man, and it really can. It really can. Like, for some people, like, you, that's something I always talk about. Like, when like, oh, selfish that you're saving time for the gym or this time you could be with your family. And it's like, it could be making you a better man. You could be a better person for your family. You could be a better husband. You could be a better father as a result of the fact that you're handling those things, those aspects of your personality. Maybe you, you're an aggressive person. Maybe you have to have that outlet. It, you know, it could be improving you in those ways, in which case it's definitely worth it. But for me, I, it, was, it was more complicated than that. It was more deeply seated than that, I think. Well, on your journey, it kept you together and right? yeah. alive. Yeah. Right? So it kept you together and alive because if you weren't together or alive or in prison, you wouldn't have this daughter right now. 
That's true. You wouldn't have this life right now. No, man. You're, all, everything led me to here. And that's, the, that's why I say, like, you know, there's things that I would that I would like to have not done, right? But, like, uh, it reminds me of, like, the example of Joseph in, in the scripture when Joseph, uh, who was sold into slavery by his brothers, runs into them at the end of the road. And, you know, but he says to them, as for you, what you did, you meant it as evil to me, but God meant it for good and used it for good so that this many Israelites would be freed and saved this day. You know, and so that's a good example of how like something, when you look back, suddenly all of that suffering makes sense. And for me, I look back and suddenly all that suffering made sense, you know? So I could be the man that my daughter needs me to be, that my wife needs me to be, you know? Not saying that's gonna be everybody's, you know, journey. And hopefully it doesn't take you until you're 42 to get to that point. <laughs> but for me, that's mm -hmm. what it took. And there was no other way to get there but this, you know? So, I mean, as far as that goes, I'm always gonna be at least willing to share my time and what I understand about the sport, you know, help as many people as I can, you know what I mean? Otherwise, I would have already bailed by now. If yeah. I, if I had the, uh, the option, I'd have been gone by now. You know how annoying it is dealing with new generations of people oh, yeah. as they pass oh, yeah. through. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like every three years, a new group of people, and they all want to question everything. I would have already moved on. I mean, but it's it's like, it's like I said, we're inextricably linked. I don't think that people like you or me are ever going to go away from the sport. As long as there's people that want to hear what we got to say, we're going to say it, we're going to help them. Yeah. You know? So how can people find you? What's the best way to find your books okay so so my, my website is fistset.black right that's where you can that's dot black not like dot com it's just the color black fistset.black we've had that since the fistset black meet which was uh years ago years ago that? now there was, mm -hmm. was a couple of them but uh that's that's a good hub to get to get the so you could sign up for the certification course which is going to be here august 26th and 27th uh so that's a full day friday and then we'll be in the afternoon on saturday yeah uh, that's the sign up for that is there uh, if you're going to take that course or if you just want the book you need the book for the course but regardless you can get that coaching manual and it's a great it's a great resource a great amount of information for anybody that's interested in competing in the sport of powerlifting specifically using the methodology the fist set methodology which kind of irons out all the it kind of takes all the guesswork out of it you know anything you're going to run into you have an answer you know uh, you have a good starting point with that so that's one thing. Um, also, the uh, the thing I, we were talking about with Greg. Yes. Right. The uh, that's that's available too. So I wrote a bench program with Greg. Greg and I, you know, we did a hundred seminars together or more. It's probably more than that actually. Uh, teaching the fist set method, and uh, he uses it with his clients. But of course, there's some differences there. Uh, he's picked up a ton of information. He was a, a legendary lifter in his own right. You know, as a competitor. And then came back and still kicked all this ass in raw, his, in his yeah. 30s raw, yeah. you know. And that's why I coached him through all that. And uh, so he learned a lot teaching. And uh, so we brought him along, you know, on the course. I, I, I And at some point we kind of, he had his fist set group. I have a, like a sort of a train heroic group that I, that I run also, which is like the team. You call him, he's got his team, I got my team. And uh, so he was like, hey, we should do a program together. Because, yeah, I mean, that's great. He took a lot of the information that was mm -hmm. the stuff we taught. And uh, it's interesting to see the way that it kind of developed on his end is a little different. But it's all based on this. When you agree on the basics with somebody, like yeah. when we can be on the same page with the basics, it's, yeah. you know, that's cool. I can talk yeah. to anybody yeah. that's, that we, are, we agree on. If, you, if, we, if, if foundational stuff that we're not agreeing on, then it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. But he and I, it was cool to be able to work together and just kind of combine our ideas and come together with it. It was a bench only program. So it's really just for bench press. The idea is in a single mesocycle to increase a person's raw bench press as much as they possibly can. So we put together, you know, all the tricks that we know, everything that, that you know, in terms of nuance, that's different, that, that could be different and still fit within the methodology of fists that we did that. So that's available on there too. Uh, that's just a program that you buy and you can use on the app for a year, you know, at your own convenience. And, uh, yeah, so that's that. I also, another cool thing that I was doing is uh, I'm, I'm running an online powerlifting meet. And that was, uh, I know it sounds kind of corny. At first, it definitely sounds corny. But my idea was, again, it comes back to the same stuff, is I want to get people to compete. 
Mm -hmm. I want to get people to try it. I know they'll like it if they do. There's a lot of people, you know, most people that go to EliteFTS.com will never do a powerlifting meet, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So why mm -hmm. <laughs> is my question. And what can we do to change that? Mm -hmm. So what I, what I decided is I'm going to have people run full macro cycles of programming through the, through the app, through the Train Heroic. And they can run a full macro cycle. We'll do like meso one, meso two, meso three, and then a peak. And then we're going to do a meet. Everybody in there is in this private group. So mm -hmm. we all get support from each other and so forth with stuff like that. Like anybody has questions, I answer stuff like that in the group, give tech corrections and stuff like that. It's private. Like you can't search for it. It's invitation only. But the idea is that this is people that might not do a powerlifting meet. Yeah. And they're going to be exposed to, oh, well, maybe I'll do this. Maybe they'll be brave enough to do that. So it's like you're getting a foot in, a foot in the water at least. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just get your toes in. If you try that, you're going through that whole process, you know, you didn't bomb out. We just meet, the videos mm -hmm. are judged and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Like you did what you're supposed to. Okay, you're going to have a hard time telling me that you can't do a meet now. Mm -hmm. And you know that that's the next step is I'm going to bully people into doing meets. Yeah. That's what I want. I want you to try it. And yeah. I think if you try it, it'll become part of you. I hope it will. Yeah. You know, and that's the idea. So. At the, I'm at this point in my career where I'm like trying to get as many beginners involved in the sport as possible. Like people that are new to it, but interested in it, but haven't actually done it. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's lots of people that are going to always be competing at a top level. There's always going to be a new tier of people every yeah. few years and that's fine. And of course I'm, I'm happy to work with if somebody applies that wants to work with yeah. me and they're at, you know, then I'll, then I'll do that. But you know, for the most part, like what you asked me, like, why am I doing it? That's why I'm still doing it. I want to get as many people as possible involved. I want them to try it, see how it can work for them, see how it can, it can become a, an important part of their life. Something that maybe helps them hold it together when things get rough. Yeah. You know, that's the thinking. So. All right. We'll have the link in yeah, the all... description, you know, for his site. So we'll drive yeah, everything cool. there. Um, I want to thank you guys for coming out. Thank you for coming back out again. Of course, and bro. we'll shut this down and we're out. Cool.